calling this meeting back to order. Uh, announcement of action. recording in progress. Oh, and <laughs> calling this meeting back to order. <laughs> um, announcement of action taken in closed session. Good evening, President Pritchett. There are three announcements coming out of closed session. The board approved a special education settlement agreement identified as OAH case number 20210-10068 by a unanimous vote of those members present, 5-0. The board approved a second special education settlement agreement identified as OAH case number 20210-30598. Again, by unanimous vote of those members present, 5-0. And finally, the board approved a third special education settlement agreement identified as OAH case number 20210-10160 by a unanimous vote of those members present, 5-0. And that is all. Great, thank you. Item 6.0, Board Workshop Strategic Plan and Other Initiatives. Item 6.1, Approve ABSB 86, Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant Plan Adoption. Good evening, Mr. Harris. Good evening, Board Member Pritchett, Board Members, and Superintendent Aguilar. My name is Vincent Harris. I'm the Chief of Continuous Improvement and Accountability here for Sacramento City Unified School District. It's my privilege tonight to present uh, for adoption our Expanded Learnings Opportunities Grant. Uh, what's really important to note about this is that as with uh, you know, special opportunities like this with one-time funding. Um, we've had a lot of opportunities to, to get input. We've looked at old plans. Um, we've actually had a strong cross-department effort, uh, including our grants office, our LCAP team, our academic office, of course, uh, student support services and health services, youth development, and our fiscal team. So as we brought this plan together, even though it was a full sprint, because of course, uh, we're just made aware of it in March, uh, we've done everything our possible to seek out as much input as, as conceivable within this period. Now, I will say up front, obviously, with a plan that's done this quickly, um, we know that there are some of the projects have a little bit more gaps to them, so there's variation. But tonight, I'm proud to share what we've got in terms of what we believe is a viable plan, knowing that we'll be evolving it over time. And you'll hear more specific concretes uh, about the plan in terms of a couple of special initiatives that a couple of my colleagues will be presenting on through this presentation. So with that, I'll go ahead and dive in. So our filter remains what we always talk about in our board meetings and in our uh, district overall is really looking at our core value and our guiding principle. And so as we thought about what initiatives to include, um, a lot of it came down to what are the things that actually will disrupt the inequities that we see uh, exist. And then of course, what helps us fulfill the promise to the guiding principle, really thinking about things that support our students and also ultimately because of the earmarks of this grant, really thinking about how do we disrupt the potential learning mitigation or learning loss uh, that we know our students have experienced in the course of the pandemic and, and make sure we're, we're putting in the best practice things that we're aware of. So there's urgency in tonight's presentation. Uh, all of you are aware this grant actually has to be uh, board adopted into our County Office of Education by June 1st. So obviously tonight we're, we're giving you our best thinking, knowing that we're gonna be evolving this over time um, as we get better information, um, but we will be giving you our best thinking this evening in terms of those things that we think will make the difference for our students with the goal of meeting the June 1st deadline, uh, because that's established by Assembly Bill 86. And then of course, as we talked, uh, in terms of the plan itself, you know, we looked at implementing, of course, over the next year up through next summer. Uh, and then, of course, we'll be bringing back updates in terms of the expenditures, updates in terms of the plan itself and the impact of it. So this is the legislative authority for the plan. Um, and again, you know, to reemphasize, this is a part of Assembly Bill 86, the COVID uh, release package. And then, of course, just kind of an echo chamber from a prior point that we need to have the plan adopted by June 1st in order to be eligible for the funding. So as we think about the funding, it really is a significant opportunity for us in terms of as it splits into this in-person instructional piece, which I know our CBO Rose Ross has given you a heads up on previously, the 13.4 million. And then we'll talk a little bit more obviously tonight about the expanded uh, learning opportunity grant, which is the, about the 20, just under 29 million. Um, as we've thought about, you know, what are those plans that make the difference for our students? And as a staff, we think are effective to uh, implement. Again, as we think about resources, it's always important to note we are always striving 
to make sure our resources are driven by student need. And so the, the goal of this graphic is just to, to ensure alignment that as we think about our planning processes. In this context, it's a unique plan that actually has been running concurrently with our LCAP process, but really we've tried to apply the same principles, this notion of looking at our student need base, having that then drive our planning process as we aspire to do that with our local control accountability plan and with our school plans for student achievement. So it is the same with our expanded learning opportunities grant, is really thinking through how student priorities drive our actual spending. So as we think about the grant itself, obviously it's, it's, it's heavy, right? The, the good news is it's heavy in the context of there's lots to be covered by it. Uh, so as we think about you know, all the key initiatives listed here, um, none of them are any more necessarily more important than the other, but certainly as we think about our learning reality, uh, accelerating progress to close learning gaps, we know has been a big theme and you'll see that also in the community feedback as well, but also supports for our credit deficient students. And then frankly, this notion of how do we support all of our students, the whole child framework. So you'll, you'll see uh, elements of that in the plan. When we think about the student groups, they are student groups that we always talk about how do we accelerate achievement for, uh, specifically as we think about our district overall, low income, our foster youth, students experiencing homelessness, but, but also the last bullet speaks to this notion of, of the students we want to really target as well in terms of students who are below grade level um, and ultimately really look to resolve and start mitigating some of the learning loss that we know is, has been a significant issue this school year. And to some degree, speaking of prior presentations to the board, we know that overall our system has, has struggled with, with helping all of our students, particularly those who are below grade level. So, so we recognize that this isn't just a COVID item, it's, it's a systemic challenge that we're looking to tackle head on. Uh-oh, what did I do? There we go. Operator error. All right, at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to our Assistant Superintendent of Business Services, uh, Mr. Adrian Vargas, and he'll take you through the, the fiscal pieces. All right, thank you, Vincent. Can you go to the previous slide? I think That's right. Skipped. There we go. There we go. Oh, right oh, there. There we go, finally. So I just want to review a couple of fiscal requirements related to the uh, ELO grant. Uh, the first one is that at least 85% of the expenditures must be used to provide in-person services uh, for any of the seven purposes that were previously described and will be talked about uh, in some future slides. And then the second requirement um, is at least 10% of the uh, award allocation must be used to hire paraprofessionals to provide supplemental instruction and support with a priority for full-time paraprofessionals and um, a priority um, to service our English learners and students with disabilities. Next slide, please. And then here is the seven areas. Um, and the planned expenditures uh, for each. And as uh, I stated, and as Vincent mentioned, um, this is developed in coordination uh, and working with the um, structural side, and they will talk more in depth about each area, but based on our conversations and the things that are happening with our Summer Matters program, um, this is how we came up with these estimates. All right, back to you, Vincent. All right. Thank you, Mr. Vargas. And so again, stakeholder engagement has been important. Um, I'll just say up front, because of the sprint of this, we, we know that we, we haven't necessarily been able to hear from all of our stakeholders as we would like. Um, but what's important to note is that we did look to integrate the stakeholder engagement as much as we could. So we do an annual uh, LCAP uh, survey. We integrate questions along uh, the L ELO in our LCAP survey. Uh, we had a unique partnership with the Parent Institute for Quality Education, or PK. And so that became another strand during our sprint listening sessions. We included questions about it. Uh, and we'll of course, continue ongoing feedback from uh, stakeholders as we implement the plan, because we recognize that you can't, you can't have too much feedback because ultimately that helps us shape a, a more targeted and a more focused plan. So what do we hear from some of our stakeholders? And really many of the themes are themes you've heard before. Many of the themes that we know as a system are the things that our community cares about. You know, ultimately I'll just highlight two uh, because we've talked most recently about them. I mean, the context of you know, really thinking about our summer enrichment, our summer programming, really being engaging, fun, providing opportunities. And you've seen how we've used that feedback to rethink our summer programming and that we initially had a much more academic oriented uh, programming. And as we got feedback and best practices from other research practitioners, we've reformed it uh, to be in alignment with what we know folks more desire. And then, of course, you know, second bullet for the bottom speaks to this notion of it's not just about the academics for our students, but the whole child frame really speaks to addressing social emotional learning needs. And so those are really the two big themes that we'll highlight this evening with district staff leaders who'll talk you through uh, some of the initiatives that directly uh, speak to those two elements. 
And then, as I mentioned, we had a unique partnership in this journey with PK, uh, which was a great opportunity for us to try and expand the base. Again, we had a sprint. So in, in any kind of sprint, we're trying to get all hands on deck to support us. Uh, and you can see here, I mean, many of the family uh, input that they received uh, spoke to many of the things that we care about as a system, this notion of academic supports and preparation, uh, tutoring, one-on-one -on -one supports. And then, of course, again, back to the social emotional needs of our students and families. And then here, really, to a large degree, because all the percentages are so high, it really speaks to everything that's really important for us. And so as you look at the heaviness of the plan, we really are trying to do what we can to be strategic, but also recognize that this feedback is a call to action for us to operate on many levels. And so we are doing kind of the reasonability test for the things that we're doing, but we're looking to try and resolve um, as many things as we can, because we know this unique one-time funding does give us the opportunity to expand capacity in strategic ways and thoughtful ways. And so that's what we're trying to do with this plan as well. Prioritized group I've spoken to, so so you see them listed again. But maybe I'll talk a little bit more about how we are identifying students. So, and this is really important because this gives us an opportunity to leverage resources we already have. Our early identification intervention system allows us to take a multiple measure approach to identifying students. But equally important, we have the opportunity to collaborate with our various departments who are in direct service to students, so that we can make sure that even if students don't necessarily fit. The, the math of, of, an, of an early identification or a, a intervention system, we still have the ability to reach those students as well. And obviously we've seen that model play out in many of the things that we've done during the pandemic, the uh, classroom collapse as well. We've, we've seen this notion of getting the local context is really important. And of course, we've talked about the importance of the assessments that we have underway um, and using those as another tool for us to identify students. And our communications team continues to do its great work in terms of how we'll push out messaging. Uh, this just highlights some of the channels that you are very familiar with in terms of our e-connection and our, our various channels through, through site newsletters, as well as our district work. Uh, and then of course, using the telephone system as well. One of the things they did call out was this notion of how we're gonna communicate. So our communications team already has significant infrastructure to help us uh, support in that process. So at this point, I'm actually gonna turn it over to our director of youth development. We'll give you a kind of a, uh, a more deep, robust view of one of our big initiatives in this plan, our summer uh, programming. Uh, respected board president, honorable board members, and dear superintendent, I am Manpreet, director of youth development. So today I'm going to talk about summer, summer 2021. So this summer 2021 will focus on relationships. Um, we are going to have ample adults present at each site and all the student enrichment activities will give ample opportunities to our students to build a relationship with students and to build a relationships with adults and having those trusting uh, relationships. Staff will focus on more on community agreements in order to uh, address any discipline issues. Um, there will be no punitive uh, disciplinary actions. Address addressing mental health. So we are collaborating with our student support services and we will be hiring social workers. These social workers will go and do welfare check-ins from site to site. And then they will also train staff uh, on social emotional learning and they will do check-ins and do some circle times with the students on their social emotional uh, health. And we are not only focusing on the social emotional health of just for our students, but also the social workers will do check-ins with the staff too. Um, um, along with mental health, we will be focusing on, we are very careful about um, students' physical health. We know that COVID is still a reality. We will be hiring um, medical assistants who will be helping our school sites and our students to stay safe, which will Present, their presence will make sure that our students feel safe at sites. Connecting with families and communities, this is one of our objectives this year. Every Friday, we are requiring all of our community partners to do a check-in night with our, our parents. So every Friday, there will be time designated for families to do a check-in. All of our community partners will be required to do two orientations during the month of June 21st so that they know what parents want, what are some of the expectations, and how to reach out to our families whenever there is a need, and how families can reach out to our staff when they need something or need any information. High dosage of tutoring. This is one of the highlights of our programming. We have posted petitions for teachers for bilingual aids, and these teachers and bilingual aids will work with our students in small groups. Next slide, please. 
And depending on the site needs and capacity, these activities can look different from site to site. So um, we will be focusing on academics, PE, art, dance, music, CSTEM. Some of the providers that we are contracting with are Northern California School of Arts, Sacramento Theater Company, Studio T, um, Soccer USA, Street Soccer USA. They, they will focus on enrichment activities. High doses tutoring sessions will be with students, as I mentioned earlier, our academic department. They will train our teachers and um, bilingual aides and teachers will be focusing on reading in grades K through three and then focusing on English language arts in grades four through six. And our focus in middle school will be math. All teachers will receive their own individual kits to work with students in small groups. Uh, next, I'm gonna talk about middle school program uh, students. Um, at middle schools, our focus will be math and we will be having teachers and bilingual aides at middle schools too. We are also contracting with the Bay Area provider. Uh, the name is a Startup Smart Up. So students will learn how to be how to start a business. This program is regarding entrepreneurship. So students will uh, start a business or an idea of a business. Then they will compete in a short short tank kind of competition and at the school level and then in in between different school sites for uh, five middle school sites. So, the, uh, this program, they can take it to their school next school year too, because the company has agreed to provide the license to our students. So this program is not for the whole year. This program is not just a, just entrepreneurship, but also web designing and coding. Online credit recovery for our high school students uh, in a, a summer ambassadors. Sorry, this is one of our beloved programs. So when we open the application. Uh, for summer ambassadors. We have been doing this program for the last 10 years, but this year is the first year uh, when we will be paying our students uh, $14 an hour. So when we open the application for our high school students within uh, three days, we have 102 applications and we just closed the application. Out of those 182 applicants, we selected 120 to uh, interview. And then out of those 120, we selected 76 students to be our summer ambassadors during summertime. We are, uh, right now, we are in the process of getting the applications complete. Um, uh, we are very excited about this program um, and we are going to get the training done from people reaching out and also we and some, we will be teaching our students what it is like to have a job and how it is important to be responsible at a job. Um, online credit recovery for high school students. Um, uh, we will be doing at all of our high school. There will be ample opportunities for students to do to co complete their credit recovery courses so they can graduate on time. High schools will also be doing ninth and tenth grade bridge programs. We all know some of our incoming tenth graders they haven't set a foot at their school campuses. So this program will give an opportunity and introduce them their school sites to them math and advanced placement success camps. Number of our school sites will be offering advanced placement uh, courses to our students. Freedom School. And Freedom School, we have been doing this for the last six, six to seven years. This year, it will be at four of our elementary and, uh, and K-8 sites. We are very excited about this program as always. This program, the training will be done for the staff and it's being done right now by Children's Defense Fund. And uh, uh, curriculum is provided by Children's Defense Fund. This program is root, uh, rooted in civil rights movement. Summer at City Hall, we have been doing this for the last uh, six, seven years. And this year, again, we have hired three of our SCUSD teachers who will work with the, uh, collaborate with uh, City Hall. And not only they will work with our uh, Sac City Unified students, but also students from Twin Rivers and uh, Natomas. Arts-based enrichment, we are uh, in order to provide ample opportunities to our students. We are also collaborating with the SCOI at one of our K-8 sites. And SCOI has hired uh, artists who will be working with our students at the school site and all the staff is contracted by SCOI. This is our first time uh, collaborating with the SCOI 
for an art-based uh, enrichment camp, and we are very excited about this. Extended school year. This um, ESY is for those students, students with disability and students with some uh, with special needs. In order, uh, we are being very intentional about full inclusion this year. Um, ESY and summer matters at three of the sites, both will co-exist. And the reasoning behind that is that we want to make sure that we give opportunities to our students who are a part of ESY, but when they are done at 1130, then they will have the opportunity to come and mingle with other students who are in summer matters and participate in those enrichment activities because we want to give them the opportunity to have fun, uh, do some arts enrichment and participate in physical activities. And now I will hand over back to our deputy superintendent, Mr. Harris. Thank you. And really what key takeaway is, is to take away from this, this presentation is the through line. So even though it's one-time funding, because the extension of the one-time period actually crosses over school years, we actually have an opportunity to create themes. And so you'll see some of the themes under accelerating progress speak to now the kind of the school year opportunities we have. So high dose tutoring can continue um, as a part of our school year. Arts program obviously continues for our school year. You see the third bullet, which gets to capacity building, the ability to uh, launch a teacher uh, intern program. Of course, some of these things are more developed than others, but we we're excited about the opportunity to build human capacity as well, um, because that gives us a boost for our system and obviously can help us support uh, the targeted students for this grant. And then as we think about extending time, uh, opportunity to extend after school tutoring, which again, you're hearing this theme of, of dosage and tutoring um, as a reoccurring theme. And then the, the bottom bullet gets to the work that we already have underway in terms of expanding of our expanded learning programs. Really gives us an opportunity to go deeper uh, for some period with this funding uh, to help us again, build out uh, more supports across the system uh, and more sites serving more students. Is that actually going to turn the presentation over? Uh, let's see. No, I've, yep, I'm going to turn the presentation over to our Director of Student Support and Health Services, Ms. Victoria Flores. Good evening. Um, uh, and so tonight I'm going to talk about some of the integrated supports that this plan is, is outlining and, and covering. And so all of these items tonight that I'll speak about are really broad categories in service to our students and our families' needs, as Mr. Harris, Chief Harris, highlighted and looking at EIIS and some of those other um, systems that we have. And this is really around better equipping our staff to provide healing-centered, strengths-based, culturally relevant support supports and services. Um, and this is really in, in some of the categories you're going to see are student safety, parent engagement, youth-centered services. These are all items that we've heard our students as well as our parents and guardians, community partners, and community advocates ask for. And we saw that reflected in those PK surveys. So I'll just quickly take you through a few of these big, broad areas. We're looking at suicide prevention and the board you know, adopted our revised plan at our last meeting and we want to continue to deepen our work particularly around our students and our staff. Cognito has been a very successful online self-paced kind of choose your own adventure about how to support your friends and how to respond in a situation where you're worried about someone. Of course, our beloved Men's and Women's Leadership Academy, this falls with our, our youth development team um, looking to expand to five high school sites. This is a wonderful opportunity for youth leadership, youth development, um, and really helping our young people see themselves um, and see their pathways. I, I can just test my own child has participated and it was a very powerful experience. Next slide, please. Um, you're going to see in this, this might, you might pause on this one, but enhanced communication vehicles. You know, and when we had to pivot to distance learning, we quickly got cell phones out to our, our support staff because we knew we needed a way to reach our families. And texting has just been wildly successful with both our students and our families. Times where they might not want to pick up the phone or even answer an email, but they'll have a 45 minute session via text. And this is us really being um, responsive to what our, our students and our families are, are asking for and 
and um, and responding to. And then this one I know is near and dear to many of our hearts, but we're looking at a near peer mental health uh, and wellness uh, support and youth workforce development. So we've been in discussion and partnership with pro youth and families and youth forward we're for some time. So we're actually seeing these ideas, you know, come to fruition where we're going to be looking at having near peer mentorship model with specific focus on youth of color and youth who identify as LGBTQ plus so that our young people see themselves in near peer young people on their campuses as that bridge to discuss wellness and, and health and, um, and positive healthy coping. And then of course that um, youth, mental health, men, uh, youth mental wellness workforce development project for our actual Sac City students. And so we really believe that this partnership will really expand the range of mental health supports available to our students that really promote and support well-being. Next slide, please. And then of course, we're gonna be expanding our social emotional learning and training we know has been so successful and foundational for building that positive school climate, as well as healing centered trauma informed training that's provided by our support staff to our school staff and our parents, really looking at that meaningful parent engagement strategies with our face department and all of the tools and the resources that they have to provide to our families. Um, our department has undergone some um, healing centered Centered engagement training this year with Flourish Agenda, that's Dr. Jen Wright's uh, group, really looking to strengthen um, our own internal practices as we serve everyone in our community. So we'll, we'll take that work even further next year. And then of course that suicide prevention cognito online modules for our staff as well, which is so important that they know how to recognize and respond to crisis it's a colleague, a family member, or even a student. And I'll pass it back over to Chief Harris. So as we wrap up the presentation, this gets you a final portfolio of, again, a strong supports that are really meant to build capacity for staff. And so mindfulness training, obviously, we think about the context in which we're coming back out of a pandemic into the world of what a new normal is. Uh, we know that this is really important for all of us, students, staff, community members, families. And focusing on our foster youth, really recognizing as we think about accelerating achievement for one of our uh, the groups that has had some of the lowest academic performance measures, we know that we have to be intentional about building capacity uh, to build on the great work that's already underway, but to accelerate knowing we, we, can, we can't do enough to support our foster youth team, uh, the, the mighty team that we have in place there. And of course, our heroes, our school nurses over the last year um, have been on the front lines of resolving the pandemic. And, and certainly as we think about you know, their role back at school sites, as much as they've been on the front lines of the pandemic, also giving them uh, capacity, uh, strength in addressing the, the social, emotional and health and academic needs of via conferences. And then finally, uh, we have an opportunity to do more of a whole family engagement opportunity. And so as you think about the ideas that we've presented this evening and in the context of the work, it, it really is about the whole system, building academic supports. You've heard uh, in many of the slides, the notion of, of tutoring, high doses tutoring. You've also heard this notion of what does it mean to build capacity for the adults that serve our students? And so that's been uh, many of the key themes um, that you've heard this evening. As we wrap up and just reinforce uh, the, the, the kind of the administrative aspects of this. You know, our dementic, dependent charters, uh, we normally, of course, include their uh, paperwork along with the district uh, because, of course, our dependent charters are their own LEAs. But, of course, as dependent charters, they basically, to a large degree, uh, follow the, the guidance of the district itself. And then just bring you back to the timeline. Uh, tonight is our opportunity, hopefully, for board adoption. Got to be adopted by June 1st so that we can get it to the county office where they don't have an uh, authority role of approving, but there is by mandate. We have, they have to have our uh, board adopted uh, version of the plan uh, by June 1st. And then, of course, really the, the heart and soul of this will be the implementation. And so we'll, we'll have an ongoing basis come back with updates because the reality of, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is some variation in the projects because this was a sprint. Uh, and, and so in some respects, as you heard from our colleagues this evening, some things are pretty well defined, other things we're defining. And there may be other things we decide as we define things to change a little bit. So we recognize that as we implement, we'll be coming back to you with, with updates. And of course, obviously the final resolution of the spending will come in the uh, expenditure of the grant funds and the update, uh, of course, to include the actual expenditures. You know, just as a point of, of reference, I will do a quick shout out to our grant writer, uh, Diane Brown and our LCAP 
uh, SIPSA coordinator, Stephen Ramirez Fong, who actually were the backbone to write all this up. And of course, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, the host of departments who contributed. So um, obviously not a perfect plan uh, because we just found out about it in March. That's not an excuse. I'm just trying to give context. Um, but one thing I will say that when you hear about the LCAP in the next uh, board meeting, uh, you will hear symmetry, right? We're looking to create intersections that make sense. And we're looking to give an echo chamber to those things that we think are important for our system. And that's really one of the efforts that we really try to do with this plan effectively. Uh, with that, I'll end the presentation and turn it over to the board. Thank you. I believe we have five live public comments on this agenda topic. First up is Manuel Jimenez. Nicole Malevsky. Uh, Sarah Kingsley and Renee Webster Hawkins are giving their time to Angie Sutherland. Hello, I am Angie Sutherland and I'm uh, combining my time with Sarah Williams Kingsley and Renee Webster Hawkins on behalf of the Coalition for Students with Disabilities. So um, it appears that students with disabilities are one of the targeted focus groups for this program. Um, with, re, with respect to student identification and needs assessment, how will all students with disabilities be identified and assessed? In a false survey that we did for parents, um, we heard from parents of students with disabilities who attend general ed classes, special day classes, and non-public schools. And 71% of students said they did not receive their special education services in the fall. 91% of parents said the special education service delivery was not well suited to their child's needs. 57% said that their students did not have individualized transition plans, even though they were due. And this is for high school and or middle school and high school students. Um, and 43% said that their plan transition plans were not implemented appropriately. Um, and if this is indicative of the larger population of students with disabilities, the district has some work to do to make things right for students. To meet the testing requirements, um, the district is using iReady. Um, not sure if special day classes are also using iReady. If not, how there's a concern with how the progress will be measured because special education goals are measured by the special education teachers and service providers, but students with IEPs are general ed students first, and therefore their teachers should have access to iReady also. Um, also, with regard to, oh, one moment. Uh, with, with regard to um, how parents are going to be informed of uh, the opportunities for these programs. Communication in Sac City has not been ideal, especially for special education. It's very siloed. Um, in our fall survey, 38% 30, of parents said they received insufficient communications from their IEP teams, and 76% said they received no communication from the district about school resources that would support their children, child with a disability. So how will this time be different? How will parents know of the options that exist for their students with disabilities? Will all the students receive information about options in order to make informed decisions? Or will the parents of students with disabilities only be told about extended school year, AKA ESY? The focus um, on relationships is also mentioned as a key pillar. Um, schools have not been a safe place for many students with disabilities who face bullying and a lack of acceptance and support. How will this be different than in the past to create this safe space? Addressing mental health is also another pillar and holding circles to address well-being, safety and trauma could be disastrous for a student who shares their issues or seeks to resolve a problem in a peer group without a trained facilitator. So we hope that the school sites will be supported with professionals trained to facilitate these sensitive conversations. Also, high dosage tutoring is listed, but what does that look like? What is the methodology? Hopefully it is not the status quo reading and math methods that have not shown to close achievement gaps in our district. 
We're hopeful that the high dosage tutoring services go beyond typical instruction, that it that is not designed to close achievement gaps, but instead are multi-sensory and explicitly designed to meet the needs of students who have difficulty with reading, spelling, and writing, who are at below grade level and are struggling. With regard to all the different activities planned that vary site to site, is there a list of which programs will be provided at each site so parents can make informed decisions? Will students with disabilities be afforded these opportunities? Extended school year is listed as a program for students with disabilities, but ESY is not the only game in town. However, parents have traditionally not received information about all of the available options. Worse, ESY has not closed achievement gaps. Parents need to be able to understand and weigh in on appropriate options. It was mentioned by the presenter that students in ESY would coexist with other students in summer matters and only interact after 1130. Why is there not a blended ESY program or one with co-teaching? This is separate and not equal. And um, one of the integrative supports is the near peer mental health. And what a wonderful idea. Uh, many students with disabilities also have mental health needs. And um, in fact, in a survey, the survey that we did in the fall, 70% of parents said that their students' educationally related mental health services was not implemented appropriately. 80% said their children are developing new mental health issues but not receiving any support. And 50% said their children are regressing in learning and behavior. So has the district determined that this partnership would not also be beneficial to students with disabilities? We ask that you please consider expanding these opportunities to serve students with disabilities who also need this support and lastly, it's very refreshing to see some family engagement activities are being planned with FACE. The accessibility of these programs needs to be looked at since many parents are unable to come to in-person or online meetings. Personalized outreach to families with this information would be amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sutherland. There, there are no more public comments. Okay, thank you. I will open it up for board discussion questions. Oh, sir, uh, I, go ahead. President Bridget, I just want to uh, just acknowledge um, Mr. Harris spoke about this um, and just thank all of the staff that have been working toward bringing this uh, to the board for your consideration. I know that often um, we are working as hard as we can, and sometimes it feels like we are not giving enough time uh, for our community. Um, but um, I just want to uh, ask that you uh, trust that our staff have been working diligently to complete this uh, task. And, uh, and, and this is our best uh, proposal uh, for the board's consideration. I also want to just... <clears throat> Thank again, uh, uh, the ad hoc committee uh, that the board put together led by uh, members Garcia and uh, including uh, member uh, member Rhodes and, and uh, student board member Sheikh. Um, we did ask uh, for a speedy turnaround uh, in order to uh, incorporate some of those findings. And, 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 and I think that's uh, a valuable addition to this plan and, and hope that um, the board will also trust uh, Mr. Harris's uh, uh, sort of uh, front load to the board that you'll see some of this in the LCAP plan that is being finalized as well. So thanks. Thank you, Mr. Harris and all the staff that have been involved. Yes, thank you. I, I will open it up. I, I guess I can I can start if okay, you want to start. I, I, go ahead. <laughs> Just we're going in circles and niceties. Um, <laughs> So um, I do, I do want to thank staff. I know this was a very compressed timeline. So, um, so um, I, I noticed, I, I guess I don't want it to go unnoticed that you really, you really took advantage of sort of where you are at in other processes to, to really um, create those opportunities to, to get stakeholder input. So I, I just, I just want to recognize that because I know it's, it's a lot of work and you um, and, and thank you, um, uh, Superintendent, for um, also uh, highlighting that the valuable input from, you know, our partnership with VK, um, especially from voices that we normally don't hear from, um, was also very valuable as it was meant to be. It was to add value to um, the process. Um, I do have a few questions, however. 
Um, I think there's um, similar to some of the comments that we heard um, in terms of the students being identified through the early identification, identification and interve intervention system. Um, so that seems like the, the district, it, that identification will be at the district level. I'm wondering if there is going to be another sort of identification at the school site level. So a teacher um, that is identifying a student that could benefit um, from some of these services, how, how does that, how do those two work um, in case there's not a match, right? The same student is not identified by the by the system. I mean, to your question, Boria Garcia, I'll start and let another member, another member of the team speak to it if if uh, if I leave out anything of importance. But you know, as we look at slide 16, to your point completely, um, that is where the collaboration is meant to happen. And so, in various district processes, what we end up doing is publishing a list and ultimately working with site administrators who see the list. They come back and say, "Hey, you you may have missed somebody. We think it's important." It's kind of an iterative process. So the lists that we create are not necessarily imposed as the truth. They're pose as a first cut because it is data rich. But to your point completely, we we actually do build in processes where principals will come back to us and say, you know, this student appears to be someone who would benefit and we do open up opportunities, especially with the context of this program being so locally based, exactly to your point. We don't want to miss any student that a principal or teacher informs us should be a participant. So, so it's a two-step process. EIS is our way to look at things at a scalable level across the system. And then as we publish that information, then we do get site input on, on things to consider in terms of additional students. Excellent. I just wanted to make sure um, that, you know, students and member, in need. Member Garcia, if I can just interject, mm -hmm. um, as you know, um, during the reopening period, as well as our learning hubs and then our um, uh, expansion of those learning hubs when we reopened, um, I, I feel fairly confident that um, that some of the work that you're describing is already taking place right now. Um, uh, we always talk about how data represent the lives of students and that requires uh, interaction between our principals and our teachers and our families. And, um, and, and we continue to see that kind of interaction resulting in, um, uh, in a more complete and holistic review of information. To, to, to make sure that we're offering these opportunities to students. Okay, excellent. Um, and then I, I do have some questions in terms of the training for school staff um, and just comparing, there seems to be a lot of training in the um, document for staff, but um, in terms of the allocation of resources of $2 million out of the um, 28.5, I'm just wondering um, if that is... Um, going to change um, upwards maybe? And also when does the training happen? Um, I know that because of the number of days of our school year, um, training tends to happen during the school year. So um, the district backfilling with subs while teachers are in, in training. So uh, I think for me, it just it just wouldn't make sense for the training to happen before the school, the kid, before the students come into, you know, um, school the first day. So, so I'm just trying to figure out the timing of that because it's, I think it's really important for it to happen prior to students being on, on campus. Yeah, I would say Gloria Garcia, that is our going for a plan, but but that's a part of the plan we haven't formed out completely yet. So we have the, the framework and, and, and to your point, what we think are the right topics, which are getting at the operational aspect, which I, I would say, I don't, I don't know if hand I'll open it up uh, to anyone else in the team who has a little bit more concreteness for you, but I would say that is definitely something that we we have a planning stance and obviously we'll, 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 we're, we're going to be working to figure that out in the next few weeks. Okay. Um, and, and I think Ms. Flores is pop it in. So you might get a little bit more. Yeah, board member Garcia, I can speak to some of this training is um, designed to be pre service pre the school year starting, but some of it is actually designed to be throughout the year. So something like the flourish agenda healing centered engagement deepening strategies would be part of our regular professional development for our school social workers that's built into our contract already. Um, and it's it's part of the ethic of social work that continued professional development and practice, um, particularly around supervision. So it's it's a kind of a both and. Okay, um, um, that's good to know. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just ask two more questions. I'll let my colleagues ask more. I have more, but um, I'll just, uh, I wanna open it up as well. 
So um, my next question was also on, um, you know, the reality is that we don't have enough, you know, this is dist districts across the, the state don't have enough internal capacity to meet the needs of students this summer and then moving forward, right? So we are leaning, um, I think, a lot on community-based organizations. I, I think as, as the state is encouraging school districts to do as an extension to build capacity. So, um, so as I'm processing that, um, that um, reality for our district as well, I think it, it's going to be really important for us to maybe understand who those community partners will be. Um, and also ensure that the contracts um, allow for the scaling up, but also um, built in the de-escalation of services as we're losing the funds, right? Um, because we these are one-time funds. So, so just wanted to make that comment um, in terms of the um, of really leaning um, and um, with our partners in the in, in our communities who do amazing work, and I think um, and I think it, it's it would be a great partnership as um, was evidenced by our partnership with Beke. So, um, and then going hand in hand with um, some of the priorities that came back from that input is that the the family engagement or the community engagement still being of critical um, importance, and then. Um, and then the last, um, the last question that I, I want to um, make sure I ask is, I, I also want to find out how we're going to measure the success of these investments in, ster in terms of how are we going to tie it to student outcomes so that we can ensure that um, as we continue to hear updates and maybe revise the plan throughout the year, we're, we're, we're making the right um, adjustments because of the of the student outcomes. So, so um, just want to make sure that that's tied in. And I do have one last question yeah, because I see it to your question about student uh -huh. outcomes. That's where the connections to the LCAP will be so important because, of course, that's that's heavy with student outcome data, and we'll be looking to do the crosswalking and, and maybe transplanting measures from our LCAP into specific initiatives here as well that where we've already defined student targets. Right, and and then I'm thinking of. Um, you know, as these dollars are drying up, um, learning what worked, what didn't work, um, so that we have information for future years to understand where those investments need to be made. Um, hopefully, in a conversation where we can talk about how do we increase ongoing revenue um, for our district. And then um, one um, one particular voice that I thought was missing, so maybe I didn't quite catch where they're reflected is um, part of the um, the stakeholder input process, not only included um, parents, um, students, but also school site staff. So um, your teachers and, and your, your classified and your certificated um, workforce and as well as um, principals. So I'm wondering where is their voice reflected in the plan? And if it's not reflected in the plan today, when, when do we see that voice mm -hmm. in the plan um, moving forward? So to your question, Board Member Garcia, and, and this gets to your opening comments as well, because of the sprint nature of it, I definitely would agree one of our challenges was how do we integrate as many voices as possible. And so what we did was basically leverage our LCAP survey, which is, you know, widely distributed. Now, to your point, we didn't have any targeted listening sessions or targeted groups. So that's an opportunity for us to share this plan more internally and, and get feedback. So I think that's an opportunity for us. But the mechanism, to your point, was really through um, our surveying process, which is open to everybody. And, and you know, we use our e-connections and, and obviously our internal communication systems to tell folks, hey, please fill out the survey. But but to the underneath of your question, uh, that's an opportunity for us going forward as we look to implement is actually to get system feedback on, on prioritization and maybe system feedback on additional initiatives. OK, I look, I look forward to hearing how that's all going to work out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question too, Member Garcia. Uh, we, we can always improve in those areas. Um, we did make sure that we sent um, uh, staff messages uh, through uh, my weekly messages as well, just encouraging again, as Mr. Harris indicated, to fill out uh, the survey on several occasions. Um, but, but again, we, we can continue to improve in, in how we uh, seek out those, those, those additional voices as well uh, more directly. Great. 
Thank you. Great questions, Member Garcia. Um, I, I have a couple questions for you. Um, I was wondering, back to Angie Sutherland's comments um, during her public comment, I was wondering if you can kind of touch on um, the assessments piece and um, how that'll kind of like unpack that a little bit of like how it'll take place. You know, the, probably the best person to answer, if he's on, would be Matt Turkey from our curriculum and instruction office. Uh, okay. I'll defer to Matt as a Hi, I'm sorry. Would you please repeat the question? I couldn't quite hear it. Yeah. Um, uh, Angie Sutherland, during her public comments, was asking about how assessments will take place. So I'm asking if you can unpack that a little bit more regarding the assessments. Yeah, absolutely. So um, during this, is this during the summer program or during the um, during the school year? During the summer program. Sure. So during the summer program, there are four different um, programs within, sorry, three different programs during the K-8. The first one is for our current K-3 through three students. The next one is for our four through, um, sorry, five through six. And the other one is our seven, eight um, students. And within each of those, there are assessments which we have. So the first one is around reading, okay? So, and we're going to be using SIPs, and so there, were, there are assessments built into that. We're also using um, something called Amira, which is an online, um, she's, a, she's a tutor online, basically, and she helps kids read, and she gives kids feedback um, on their reading and that sort of thing. And so that's for the, for the um, one through four kids. For the five through six kids, again, there's embedded assessments for reading and writing, and uh, similarly for seven, eight in mathematics. And then will there be any focus on um, special education during that time? So the question where um, Ms. Sutherland said that um, the students are kind of uh, separated, they're actually not separated. They're actually included, all right? Okay. So I'm just going to give you an example, all right? So let's say, for example, you have a school site with a uh, a hundred spots, okay? And let's say that there are 50 students within that school site who are attending for ESY. Then 50 of those spots are already taken and there's only 50 more spots to go, okay? So that means that the students with special educational needs attending for ESY are totally and utterly included. It's an inclusive um, uh, program rather than parallel, okay? So, to that end, the assessments would be put in place as well, as would any accommodations which are needed. And the general education teacher would then need to be working hand in hand with the special education teacher also. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, my next question is regarding the high dosage of tutoring um, section on here. And I'm wondering, it says teachers will work with small groups of students. Are these our teachers or... Um, are we working with community-based partners? And These are our teachers. So okay. basically the community-based partners, um, we're going to split it up into each of the team leads who's a, from a community-based partner will have about 10 students in their, in their classroom, okay? And then there, we want to, depending on how many teachers we get, what we really want is one teacher per class of 10 students, OK, so that every single day that teacher can then pull out of the classroom um, groups of three or four. So 10, you've got two groups of three, one group of four for 45 minute increments on that high dosage tutoring. So that's what's happening during that time. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to say how much I appreciate like all the different types of groups as we're going through this. Um, one thing I did see on here that caught my eye and I don't expect it to be within this plan, but maybe kind of thinking outward a little bit in the past, we've worked with the city of refuge um, for the shine program for um, girl empowerment. And with um, such a high number of um, young teens and um and adults, really, um, but really young teens um, in the impact of human trafficking. Um, I'm just wondering if we can think about maybe adding that into this. Um, it's a fairly low cost program for us for the benefit that we give our students. Um, so if you can kind of look into that. And then I think that is actually, oh, um, how do we choose the sites for the family engagement? How are... How, how is that going to work? Is it all of our sites that are that are open for the training for staff? Sorry, it's on page 25. 
says capacity for community school teams, family engagement, learning institute. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that one offhand. I'll speak for another team member on that. Is it? It's a two-day training for stakeholders. So I'm assuming like it's probably here, or is it at school sites? I guess that's my question. Right. I'll think back to you on that. Okay, one. that's fine. That's fine. All right. Uh, other. I'll, I'll take a look at it and if we can both take a look at it, that would be great. Member Morosky, did I see your sign up? Oh, Member Wu, sorry. And then, and then Member Morosky, okay. Thank you. Slide 22. It's a self directed standalone um, program. Is it going to sit on the um, on the schools? I mean, uh, the district's website. How are the students going to learn about it? And then, you know, it's a self directed training, but it will do us no good if nobody use, utilizes it. I miss Florida. We'll be able to. Thank you so much. We've actually used this program before with our students. It's Cognito. So they log in, in on and there is a staff member there present to help facilitate, make sure students complete and then debrief about it. Um, the beauty, though, is that depending on their knowledge, their prior experience and knowledge, they get to kind of choose their own learning adventure. And it, it it's almost like a video game. So our students really respond. So do our staff, honestly. Um, but to your point, it is a structured kind of of guided activity. Thank you, Member Wu. Member Morosky? Oh, thank you. Um, uh, so first, I want to thank staff for all the hard work that went into this plan. Um, I know it was, it was quick. There's a lot of different um, aspects to it. And I know this plan is a little bit um, unique in that it, you know, it was had a very quick time frame. It has really um, specific students, student groups that need to be served, um, specific types of interventions. So I think, you know, it, it seems to do a really good job at, um, at uh, covering those bases. Um, I guess uh, one thing I was struggling with a bit was it, it, I feel like it's very hard to get a sense of how how many students will be served by each of these um, you know programs? Which students? Like how how are we going to do the targeting? And I'm I'm asking I guess from the perspective that you know I I know that not all students were affected equally uh, of course by the uh, the last year, but all students were affected. So I'm thinking about it as you know what do we owe you know, all of our students who have suffered through, you know, uh, this past year. And then how are we making sure that we're, we're also providing the targeted supports to, to the students who have struggled the most? And how are we kind of balancing those two things? And, um, and also, you know, to me, it makes sense to, to look at the individual students' needs rather than kind of make assumptions about, you know, this site needs this or, but I, I'm just wondering how we're, how we're approaching those, um, those questions. Right. And, and so my, my answer will be incomplete for Morowski because frankly, that is probably the next phase that we have to get underneath. I mean, the reality of it, we built the plan to the context of what are broad generalizations about our students, what are broad things we know that were impactful. I think what you're getting at is the operational element of the plan. And ultimately that's where it'll be important for us to bring updates to the board uh, because my hunch will be and it is that we'll probably as we dig into who are the who's that are going to various programs that probably will reprioritize how we designate certain programs so i, I don't want to give you a, a non-answer but i want to be honest and in the context of how we're building the plan those are the things we got to get underneath our mm -hmm. first phase of this because as you mentioned the, the sprint was required was making sure we had programs we felt were good <laughs> for our students particularly for students who are at risk to your point because we actually want to make sure whatever we do impacts the students who are designated the underneath your question is absolutely important in terms of differentiation of those supports. Mm -hmm. And that's the work that's ahead of us to make sure we can do that with credibility. 
Okay. Okay. No, that's it. Um, <coughs> so and and member Rossi, can I just interject? And, and, and it goes also back to um, uh, the idea of staffing capacity. And so that's, that's another item that we are going to have to come back to the board as we start releasing and posting these positions is what, what does uh, staffing look like? Um, I, I would ask Mr. Turkey, for example, uh, back to the question that Ms. Sutherland, I think uh, was mentioning in public comment about, you know, what is high, high dosage tutoring? Is it just tutoring with a different name? And so um, we, we, we know what it looks like and what it should look like the question is will we have enough teachers uh to to do that kind of work and so mr turkey if you could just explain uh kind of high level what high dosage tutoring looks like yeah absolutely so there's some hallmarks of, of high dosage tutoring um so the first one is dosage okay so um it's got to be a minimum of three times a week if it's less than three times a week, then that's obviously not good. More is better. So three to five times a week is what we're aiming for. Um, the next one is duration. Okay, so we're really looking at somewhere in between 40 and 60 minutes in duration of time. Okay, um, the next aspect of the high dosage tutoring is then around um, how many kids you have. All right, so about three or four Basically, the lower the size, the better, okay? If it gets above three or four, then what you have to do is start splitting into multiple small groups rather than one small group, and that takes a different level of skill. Um, the next thing which you need is um, basically some, some good standards-based curriculum, which is on grade level, okay, which is going to stretch kids, but it's at the right, right place for kids, basically. Um, and then we need some assessments in place so that we can see that it's working. Um, those are really the hallmarks of high dosage tutoring. And the kids are going to be very specifically chosen and chosen for the specific thing which you're giving them high dosage tutoring around. Where tutoring typically fails, for, I'll just want to give you a very quick example. As a math teacher, you could say, okay, anybody who's got any problems, come see me at Tuesday after school. That will work for some kids who come with a very specific problem and say, hey, Mr. Turkey, can you help me with graphing equations? Yes, I can help you with graphing equations, okay? But with kids who are, let's say, two, three years behind grade level, something much more intensive and much more purposeful is needed where it isn't where the kids come and say, I'm going to tell you what I need, teacher, Right? It's the other way around, where the teacher is basically assessing the kids and saying, okay, as a teacher of this subject, I know what you need, and I can give you the intensity of tutoring to be able to meet those needs. So I hope that explains it somewhat. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, so uh, I guess, what, what is the plan for coming back to the board? Um, to because I, I know there's there's still you know questions questions to be answered and I mean to to me I I would hope that we can you know that we're in the position finally since <laughs> since I've been on the board of of having some resources to be able to address you know the needs that we know exist um, that we that we kind of uh, work work towards specific outcomes and work from you know, the needs that are identified and, you know, like, can we make a statement like through this plan, we are going to, you know, address all of the, you know, K through three kids who are not reading on grade level, they will get X, you know, something like that. Like, you know, that's what I'm kind of trying to wrap my head around. Um, like, I like all the elements of it, but it's, it's hard for me to see, you know, how, like what exactly we'll be getting out of it. Um, and so I, I would, I don't know what, what is the appropriate process to, you know, to further define those things and how do you see that playing out? Like, does the board have a role in, in that? Is that a staff, you know, driven thing that will come back and tell, tell us like, this is what we think we can do given this capacity constraints or, 
I'll offer an initial thought and certainly defer to superintendent. I mean, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we're looking for synchronicity of plans, particularly yeah. in the context of our LCAP. Um, and so ultimately, I think some of the measures you're speaking to will will flag in our LCAP because that will have measurable outcomes that will have uh, the three year targets that will create the ability for the board to review and monitor. I think the other half of your question comes in the build out. So to the degree that our LCAP metrics potentially will be incomplete, that's where staff will come back and present to the board other ideas about the return on investment, uh, specifically as it relates to student outcomes. So I think you know my first answer will be creating synchronicity of outcomes because we do have outcomes in the draft LCAP that we've already published and we're refining those. But I think to your other part of your question in terms of the whole plan, that's where we'll have to take some time and actually do the prioritization of everything that's in it and figure out, okay, let's lift this out as an additional outcome measure. So I do think we have the first starter outcome measures through our OCAP, and I think we need to add on to it as we understand better how the plan implements any impact. Uh, because ultimately, while we believe there's research-based practices and we believe in those research-based practices, I think to your question, Paul Morawski, we'll have to validate you know, this is what we think the impact is for students and be able to just present that to you. So again, I, I would say the first wave will be our LCAP measures, and mm -hmm. those are disaggregated by student group. And then the next wave will be once we get the plan formed more in terms of those pieces that we, we have uh, shared are more formative tonight. Once we lock those in, then we'll come back and share. To your other question on, on updates, certainly we can plan for quarterly updates on the plan and make that a routine for next school year. So you have an ongoing conversation because again, is the synchronicity and the board's already asked for this, the synchronicity of our LCAP and our planning documents is, is important. And so we'll yeah. commit to making sure those are brought back in, a, in the public square on a regular basis so as you can see both the process and, and the impact. Yeah, I, I would like to spend some time um, maybe over the summer figuring out what, you know, we have a lot going on, right? We have a lot of plans. We have a lot of resources. We have a lot of programs um, to figure out maybe some kind of integration in terms of reporting and something that's more efficient and we can actually track like maybe based on just the LCAP outcomes. And these are the, these are the different program threads that we have that are addressing the outcomes that we want to see. Cause I feel like we really need that coherence and that, you know, that, conversation to be able to show our community these are the <laughs> these are the things that we're addressing and to be able to like understand that ourselves um okay well thank Baroski. you that was i mean like the high level stuff yes. Baroski, i'd also offer that um as i think we may have sent and if we haven't we can uh, send it certainly the policy brief uh about restorative restart um and we are very much uh, in conversations with some of the uh, researchers that uh, were part of that that policy brief, and and I say it because I think that uh, there's going to be more and more discussion about how we are going to track uh, and monitor the effectiveness of these kinds of programs. Uh, because mm -hmm. certainly, as you heard, uh, the focus is not going to be all on academics, um, and so as those individuals are. Uh, continuing to provide updates to us about what are sort of the longer term areas that we're going to be able to track the effectiveness of something that we do in the summer that, um, again, uh, is aligned to, 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 to what they're encouraging us to focus on as part of these efforts, uh, we will continue to inform and, and be engaged with them so that we can tie uh, some summer related uh, findings to something that, um, you know, we can, we can, we, we might be able to see uh, during the academic year, the, the upcoming academic year. Okay. But yeah, that's, that's wonderful. I mean, I think that, you know, learning um, will, will inform us as member Garcia mentioned. Um, so I think this is going to be kind of an ongoing conversation and uh, we'll continue to talk about, you know, when we talk about the federal funds and how, you know, the federal funds will layer on top of what, you know, what we've adopted here and align and <clears throat> I'm hopeful and, and I believe they will. Um, so I just want to say, uh, I am absolutely thrilled to see the peer mental health and near peer mental health um, uh, program that, that I think that's going to be really powerful. Um, I think, you know, it, it has had really good outcomes um, when it's been tried. So I'm, I'm just really appreciative of, um, of the inclusion of that. I know we've been, we've been talking about it for many, many months and um, just thrilled to, to we'll, I will be thrilled to see our, our students um, participate in that. 
Um, so I'll just mention a couple other things and you don't need to, you know, talk about them um, or respond to them because they'll be, uh, I think, areas of conversation. But um, one thing I've been wondering about is, you know, to get to that individual need, can we do sort of universal assessments and have individualized learning recovery plans for each student? How viable is that? Um, I'm concerned about what we're doing specifically um, for the early grades on those foundational literacy, literacy skills. Um, how specifically are we re-engaging our students who are disengaged? Um, you know, what more are we doing for students with disabilities who did not receive, you know, or received uh, services that were not in person the way they were used to. Um, and like cultural and linguistic access and parent empowerment. I think this is an opportunity to um, to make some progress there. So those are <laughs> those are just the other the other things that came to mind um, in reviewing this. And uh, again, I really appreciate all the work that's gone into us and continuing. Um, look forward to continuing that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Member Morowski. All right, are there any other? Oh, Member Rhodes. Um, uh, thank you, all of my colleagues who gave insight and their perspective. Um, very excited to see this um, and even the, the stakeholder portions of it. Um, as, as Member Garcia says, we can probably do more internally around our teachers and, and, and especially our staff members. Um, but what we have here is better actually than what we did before. Uh, so I do appreciate the, um, the incremental change um, and, and moving forward to do even more. Um, I had a quick question. I will not hold you guys too long at all. Um, two things, the high dose tutoring, um, does the high dose tutoring also uh, include our um, EL students? And how are we incorporating uh, those groups into uh, this work and plan uh, around recovery? I'll, I'll just ask that first thing you guys can I'll ask that next one next. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, our EL students were part of the priority uh, groups who were first invited to apply um, for a space in the summer program. And in terms of the high doses tutoring, yes, they'll be getting the high doses tutoring. And we're also hiring bilingual aides who will be able to work within the classroom with the students as well. Um, so um, that will be for our students, uh, our EL students. Perfect. Thank you for that. And then um, our sites that have dual immersion uh, programs, um, will we be offering um, dual immersion programs? Um, and, and, and during our, our summer programs um, at the sites that already hold them or will these summer programs only be held in English? The summer programs I believe will only be held in English. I do not believe we're holding any dual immersion ones at this time. Okay, I, I would like to just point out, it seems, it seems loud, but <laughs> I, I would like to uh, uh, just point out also uh, for our dual immersion programs, um, there is a, there's a learning loss uh, in, in both languages. Um, and so as we ask the youth to matriculate into the next grades and, and be able to continue along this pathway, I think it is imperative uh, that those youth also get those supports in that language program. Um, so something to consider and look at um, as we build this thing out. So thank you guys for your time. Great point. Thank you. Thank you, Member Rhodes. All right, this is an action item, so I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Yes. All right, I have a motion of second. Student preferential vote. Aye. Superintendent, roll call. Member Pritchett. Aye. Member Morawski. Aye. Member Wu. Aye. Member Garcia. Aye. Member Rhodes. Aye. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you, staff, for this, all your hard work. Uh, item 6.2, facilities master plan update. Ms. Ramos and uh, Mr. Browning. Uh, good evening, uh, President Pritchard and board member superintendent. 
Uh, tonight, we're going to be presenting you with an update on the facility master plan before we get into that presentation, just for the benefit of folks who may not know, be familiar with this uh, project. Uh, the district issued a RFP a couple of years ago in 2019 to solicit a group to uh, complete the facility master plan. And the firm that was selected is DLR to uh, prepare a five-year facility master plan. And what that is, it's basically a collection of data of our facilities um, to, to help us plan for future uh, facility improvements and prioritize uh, resources. And the unique thing about this plan is that it also includes a district equity index um, that will further assist in, in prioritizing these capital improvement projects. And so um, DLR is going to sh uh, share with you this evening um, the uh, progress to date and then the next step. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to our interim um, assistant super facilities, um, Dr. Lee Sata, so he can um, make introductions. Lee? Yes, great. Thank you so much, Rose. And thank you, Board of Ed members, for uh, the opportunity for us to present to you this evening. I want to remind everyone that this is a snapshot of a process that began way back in 2019, uh, as Rose said, with the selection of DLR as our architects who are going to complete the facilities master plan. And to date, they've completed several assessments, which they will share with you. Uh, and also recently, I wanted to say that we had a full stop um, to the process in order to take a hard look at the equity issues that Rose mentioned and come up with an equity index that is relevant to our group. Um, we're working closely with the steering committee and the central planning group um, who had provided some feedback and gave us some guidance on how to proceed there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so the next step I'd like to do is just introduce a, the DLR and RSS consulting teams. I would like to say special thanks to Amna Javed, who has been our facilities man manager, pushing the process forward. Nathaniel Browning, our director, and of course, Rose Ramos, who's been providing the overall leadership. And so with that, I'll introduce Mark Covington with DLR and Reg Dr. Regina Stanback stroud with RSS Consulting, and they'll introduce their teams and take you through the presentation. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Dr. Sada. Uh, there we go. My name is Mark Covington. Good evening, members, uh, Superintendent Aguilar and the Sac City USD uh, community. My name is Mark Covington, Principal Architect with DLR Group. Uh, we're honored to be with you tonight to present an update to your facilities condition assessment and master plan. We have about 20 minutes to provide you an update on what we've accomplished where we are today and where we're headed for the next few months. So next slide, please. I'd like to start us off with just a high level introduction of, of your team. As Dr. Sada had said, uh, a DLR group is more than architects. Uh, we are experts in research, community school or public school design and educational planning. Uh, this team has invested thousands of hours in assessing your facilities, collecting data and reaching out to your community. Uh, Mr. Blewett and Ms. Levezo are both on the call with us here tonight, and you will hear more from them later. And so to complement this team, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Sada has said, Miss um, um, Ramos and her staff introduced us to a, to a group of equity-minded professionals. But I must share that every time we meet with our new partners, I learn something new. Uh, next slide, please. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Regina Stanbeck stroud with RSS Consulting for a brief introduction of her team. Thank you, Mark, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sata. Uh, board President uh, Pritchett and members of the board, Superintendent Aguilar, and uh, members of the dais here, colleagues and friends in the community, uh, thank you for the opportunity to introduce the RSS consulting team. I'd like to start with introducing myself. I'm a recently retired uh, community college chancellor and president uh, of a college, um, and also have served as a vice president of instruction and a professor of uh, nursing sciences. I'm widely recognized um, for my scholarship in critical race and educational leadership. Um, and I'm regarded for my work, highly regarded for my work on student equity and diversity, economic empowerment, and anti-poverty strategies. Also on my team, I'd like to go to the next person beside me on this picture is Diane White. She's the president and founder of Integrated Academic Solutions, and she brings over 30 years 
of experience in higher education, including 25 years of award-winning teaching, as well as administrative and consultative uh, positions, all of which inform her student-centered approach to strategic, integrated, and comprehensive master planning. And then quickly, I would like to introduce Dr. Casey Graney. Uh, she joins us and has served the bulk of her career in uh, leading institutional research planning and effectiveness and the California Community College System. And she's recognized as an expert further in student success through data-informed uh, decisions. And finally, Dr. Siri Brown, who is currently the Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs and Support Services at the Peralta Community College District. She is a critical race scholar as well and a historian with an emphasis in early American, African-American and women's history. And with this, we bring our perspective and have had, the, uh, have had the pleasure and the honor of being able to engage in the conversations and ensuring the uh, discussions around uh, equity, literacy, and uh, critical race. Thank you. You're muted, Mark. You will hear more from Dr. Stanbeck Stroud and her team a little later on in the uh, in, the, in the presentation, excuse me. So um, next slide, please. So what we first wanna share with you is, uh, is, is the why for facilities master plan and facilities condition assessment. Um, it go through it really fast. You can see in the red text that we just want to uh, align ourselves Align the learning environment to support uh, the district's goal. And how do we do that? We do that for, through a facilities assessment and a master plan. Next slide, please. So what is it? What is it? What is the assessment and master plan? Well, it's where we collect data to help you determine how the district will prioritize resources for future capital improvement projects. You can just have a brief read of that. Next slide, please. The purpose of what we're what we were doing for the district is to just take the facilities from their current state and bridge current state of facilities to the future state of facilities. Next slide, please. So I want to just share out with you what we've accomplished. Uh, Dr. Sada has already shared, and and, and Ms. Ramos has already shared. Uh, we they brought you the district has brought a, a RFP a request for proposals to us in February. And the board did then approved it in uh, June of 2019, and we anticipate a release of data that we have gathered, made available around the June around June 1st. Next slide, please. So the whole team is made up not only of those that are in this meeting and with us tonight, but is inclusive of strategic partners. We've had numerous meetings with key stakeholders over the past 20 months, including a steering group, which helped guides the process an intentional core planning group to establish a vision. And this group also includes Dr. Stanbeck Stroud's team and department leadership to share out and help us with defining specific department needs. And you can see the multiple meeting dates that we've had. There are several others besides the ones that are on your screen, but uh, just take note that uh, June 16th coming up in next month will be another core planning group meeting. Next slide, please. So the next few slides, I'm just going to walk through how we've assessed your campuses, uh, what we've done according to our contract. And we've assessed each campus with regards to its adequacy of the learning environment and how it contributes to student achievement. Uh, we evaluate the campuses through a six, six evidence-based lenses that make up that petal-shaped flower that you see uh, in the screen right before you. And my partner, Anton Blewett, will speak to that more, uh, um, more, on, uh, more to this information. And how do we use this to build on a vision and educational specifications for the district facilities? Next slide, please. So the state of California has set a goal where all public buildings become zero net energy by 2030. And what that means is that it, it needs to be a zero net, net zero balance, if you will, where the energy production must be equal to the energy consumption, therefore equaling the two out and making it zero literally zero consumption. Uh, we perform detailed assessments to assist the district with prioritizing its resources on future projects in order to meet this state goal. Next slide, please. So through our uh, data gathering process, our team has also assessed each site with regards to technology readiness. Uh, we understand that there's been some challenges that have surfaced recently. 
and that was shared out with us. And our team proactively uh, reached out to Dr. Lyons and to capture a little bit better understanding of your technology challenges and the specific needs. And I think that meeting happened uh, earlier this week, in fact. Next slide, please. We've also inventoried all of your campuses to gather information on enrollment, uh, capacities, and projections. We've gotten that information from your the, the district's demographer, and that sort of helps us understand how each campus is utilized. Next slide, please. And through our site visits, we've performed safety and security assessments targeting adequacy of areas like your student drop-offs, your fire alarm systems, uh, exterior lighting, uh, camera, and intrusion alarm systems. Next slide, please. And it's a little hard to read this one, but we want to make sure that uh, that uh, that we share with you. This is simply a snapshot and an opportunity for us to indicate that we barcoded all of your equipment and uploaded it into the school district's uh, maintenance software program called Dude Solutions. And this helps this better assist and helps with long term uh, planning and with preventative with your preventative maintenance program. Next slide, please. So this is sort of where we get into the meat of the facilities condition assessment and the facilities condition index. And you'll hear me using the acronym FCI uh, several times in, for, the, for the remainder of my slides. And I just wanna draw your attention to the first bullet that has the dark, uh, excuse me, the bold text. And the FCI is an objective indication of a building's overall condition. It is defined as the ratio of cost of current needs divided by the current replacement value of that facility. So for fast math, if you have a, if we have a facility that has a current replacement value of $30 million and its current needs are $10 million, that's one third, that's 33% of, uh, of uh, FCI would be considered uh, 33%. So you would look down and see in the, in the, uh, the matrix below you, that would be in the pink range, that would be above, that area has, that has reached its useful life end of its useful life and serviceable life and renewal of the facility is now necessary. So what's key to what we show in our uh, assessments and our index is whatever FCI is greater than 20% results in a facility with poor condition. That's in the red text at the bottom. Next slide, please. So the district has used the, uh, I just want to give accolades to the community for passing measure H and the, uh, uh, the district used uh, our facilities condition assessment back in November of 2019 and identified $3.5 billion in facilities repairs and needs over the next 10 years. And the board adopted resolution 3113 and then got the bond, uh, bond measure H was passed in March of 2020 with a 62 plus percent vote. So kudos to the community on passing that. Next slide, please. So this is a graph of each of your, uh, dot of each of your campuses as it relates to the facilities condition index. <clears throat> so to the far left is in pink are your poor condition campuses, middle fair condition campuses, good condition campuses based on their FCI number. Dotted line is, your, uh, is the average of all of the campuses across the district at 13.51%. So I just draw your attention to the far left where you can see the, the dots hit that 25% over there. Um, there are still, there are five campuses that are up above 25%, even one above 30% of a facilities condition index, which takes 30% of its current value to just do necessary repairs. I want to make sure you, that we all understand that. Uh, next slide, please. So this is another snapshot of the data we collected. We like, to sh we like to show this one. And the reason we show this is because it's important to know that we've collected over, this is an Excel file, by the way, it's 20,000 rows of data and 22 columns wide. And so it is just a massive document that all the facilities condition indexes and assessments are built off of this one, this file. Next slide, please. So this is what we shared with the board back in November of 2019, which then advanced into passing measure H, or assisting with it. Uh, this shows a $3.5 billion in uh, repair costs for the district and on all facilities over the next 10 years. And it's, uh, it, it shows in pie charts how it's distributed across all the campuses, and it shows in other pie charts how it, it, um, it, how it uh, uh, aligns with different buildings and site uh, um, um, items on each one of the school sites. So you can kind of see 
a pie chart. And this is this is uh, like Dr. Sada said earlier, this is a snapshot in time. This is what it looked like in November of 2019 to assist with the bond, obviously. Next slide, please. So I want to just take a, take a moment to talk about how all of the facilities condition data begins to translate into graphics. As I shared before, we've been at several campuses, gathered a lot of data. You can see on Washington Elementary on the left, Nicholas Elementary on the right. We've been to all the districts. We've identified all the spaces on all the site. We've identified the needs and identified the, the equipment that has been a, a barcoded and safety security, all the information I've shared with you for each one of these campuses. Now that translates into the next slide, please. Translates into how we assess the facility condition. This graphic will be a part of a final master plan to show the facility condition of Washington Elementary School. You can see at the bottom of your screen on the left, lands at 6.6 .6 FCI, puts it in the blue range, right? In the good condition. But as you look at Nicholas Elementary School, that moves way over there to the pink side of that graph that I showed you earlier, 28.5% FCI. So, and you can see in the different rooms, which ones are the different spaces on the buildings by the different color codes that we use, how we go from uh, uh, facilities in great need compared to facilities that are that are in uh, not so much need. So uh, um, all of this, uh, all of this information um, will give you a 10,000 foot view of what we've accomplished. Uh, next slide, please. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Dr. Stanbeck Stroud and Mr. Blewett to share with you where we are in the process today. Thank you, thank you very much, Mark. And if you can go to the next slide, please. We have been engaged with the uh, stakeholder uh, group, as a matter of fact, the core planning group, which is made up of parents and community members and partner organizations and teaching and learning uh, and multi-constituent members of the district that include administrators, uh, teachers, and uh, classified professional staff have been engaged in doing some pretty impressive work. And we've had the opportunity to join uh, this group and, and uh, um, extend the conversation with regard to equity and making sure that, that factors and issues of equity are considered in the prioritization process and the allocation of the resources. In doing this work, the, the core planning group has engaged in these discussions and came up with or they dis they uh, shared with us the factors that they thought needed to be incorporated. And one of the things that we did was we um, verified with them. This is what we this is what we heard you say. Uh, this is what you said to us. This is what we heard, and we we uh, checked with them and verified with them uh, even at a subsequent meeting to make sure that that was the case. And they came up with four particular areas. One was that equity matters. Two neighborhoods matter three, history matters, and four, voices matter. So with regard to the issues, those four issues, the equity matters was the top issue. And the top issue that they felt like needed to be emphasized is that all students have the equal opportunity to succeed educationally, regardless of the neighborhood that they in, they're in or regardless of their race, so that you have the outcomes and experiences of students that are not predicted by race. And they, they spoke very specifically to the historical inequities in the district, but particularly the recent school closures. They have been very vocal about making sure or asking and, and, uh, and appreciating the fact that the district is acknowledging historical inequities, uh, that's, that, that our processes uh, simply have uh, managed to, um, to replicate. Uh, and they also uh, gave, some specific suggestions around making sure that there is shared decision making and and making sure that there are equitable uh, resources and which means that it wouldn't necessarily be that all schools get the same resources, but that there would be equitable resources. The other thing that they said is that neighborhoods matter. This is a big part of the conversation. It was this, the um, second most uh, popular issue in terms of what needed to be emphasized. Uh, and that was uh, due in part to the historical inequities as well that resulted in under-resource in some schools and um, and in the consideration of uh, school closures. Now, the interesting thing about this is that there is a, a very uh, high interest in the, uh, making sure that they're addressing the impact of the way in which open enrollment causes problems, it causes the reallocation and the shifting of allocation of resources from under-resourced uh, institutions or under-resourced schools to schools that uh, may be in higher or more affluent areas. 
and and the the actual structure itself in and of itself uh, replicates that inequity as well. So they want to make sure that the factors that are in place uh, mitigate that that structural um, that structure of inequity that exists. And so that we anticipate that there'll be a lot of uh, discussion on that as well, and we expect to be able to dedicate more time to that at the next meeting. They also said that history matters. And that history is that, be, that, that they said to pay attention to the fact that there is a historical inequity in the Sacramento City School District, including the history of redlining in non-white neighborhoods. And that led to inadequate and inequitable distribution of resources within the district and race has been a major factor. So we have been unapologetic in, in terms of having the discussions as it relates to race, uh, community members and parents or people that are participating in the uh, core group and some of them hold those, you know, dual positions have been uh, quite vocal uh, about that, but they also have acknowledged the fact that the district is is paying attention to or has at least uh, openly acknowledged the historical uh, issues. And then finally, the one of the things I will say is that they address the issue of that voices matter and they uh, indicated that they were um, that this needed to be informed by these multiple voices and move some of the voices that have been in the margins to the center. And the reality is that we have processes that are designed to get those voices, but even they brought up, for an example, at the previous meeting, you know, there were probably there are a lot of people on the the core planning group, but there probably were about twelve to fourteen members that were not a part of the district or not a part of the consulting team or not a part of the architectural team. So they are really interested in making sure that we do everything that we can in order to enhance those voices. And we actually have some ideas and some strategies in, in mind to be able to do that. A few other things came up and then I'll close it with this uh, and move to the next uh, slide, um, is that there, there were uh, some uh, discussions about uh, making sure that we have the conversations about student, how students with disabilities are affected and pay attention to the accessibility uh, at, and in all of the schools and pay attention particularly to the availability of special day classes uh, because they're only offered in some sites. And, and with that, the other, other issues also did come up, but with that, I'd like to move to ask Diane White to talk a little bit about, so how do we pull all of this together and what is the North Star? What is the guiding star in this? And she's gonna talk about the old Thank you. So first the core value and guiding principle statements, which appear in the draft LCAP document provide the foundation for that key plan and also for critical plant integration. The core value statement focuses on interrupting inequities that exist to level the playing field and provide opportunities for everyone to learn, grow and reach their greatness. And the guiding principle states, SCUSD's commitment to equity-driven decision-making and resource allocation will be critical as a district strives to improve outcomes for all students and close the significant performance gaps between students. So the LCAP is your North Star for planning, meaning that the LCAP is the primary navigational marker that will guide the district toward its purposeful destination, which will be achieved through the implementation of the LCAP's goals. In short, the LCAP has been grounded in equity-centered data, and that data has been used to develop its goals. And together, the LCAP's goals and resulting, uh, the LCAP data and resulting goals are going to be used to inform the facilities master plan, the prioritization of district resources in ways that will level the playing field and close opportunity gaps that exist between different student groups. Next slide, please. So uh, may I ask Dr. Graney to speak to the issue of the equity indicators? Thank you, Diane. Thank you. The district's core planning group for the facilities master plan has been discerning the best approach to ensure that equity is prioritized in selecting future projects. Current thinking is to develop three indicators to inform decisions. Regarding students, the core planning group believes students with the greatest opportunity gaps should be prioritized to accelerate their achievement. The new draft LCAP, as Diane mentioned, is data informed and has been well vetted, and it prioritizes specific groups of students, including foster youth, homeless youth, English learners, students with disabilities, and students of color. The core group wishes to prioritize the same student groups. Neighborhoods are, of course, the setting for all schools, 
and the core planning group would like to factor in the condition of a neighborhood. We are considering using an established neighborhood index that takes into account socioeconomic status, racial segregation, poverty concentration, and health and environmental factors. Lastly, school sites most in need of improvement will be prioritized or should be prioritized according to the district's core planning group. The status of the health and safety risks, ADA compliance, and the adequacy and condition of furniture and spaces has been rated by outside experts using measures from the facility condition index, which was explained by DLR earlier in this presentation. I'd like to now hand the presentation over to Anton Blut from DLR, who has been expertly shepherding this project. Next slide. Thank you, Casey. So as Casey mentioned, I'm really here to share a little bit about that bridge that Mark showed between the LCAP, Measured North Star, and Measure H, right? Funds for facility improvement projects. And part of that critical bridge is what we call the educational specification. So I want you to think about those really as your vision for the learning environment. And by that, I mean the student experience. And we know that there are a number of students that are navigating a variety of barriers, right? Ranging from poverty, uh, housing instability, food insecurity, lack of access to healthcare. But at the same time, these students are incredibly resilient. They know their worth and they have spoken loudly to us that they deserve great facilities. And we also know that we've got a wealth of community assets that we can draw upon and families believe in education as the practice of freedom. So with that, this core planning group, the program focus groups, the facility group have really pushed on us to take an expanded view of the facility, right? So that it's more than just providing students with warm, safe and dry environments, but we can actually use it to create design strategies tailored to all of your LCAP sub goals from college and career readiness, to targeted support for students, culture and climate. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit about what those design strategies look like. And before I begin, I just want you to kind of imagine a student's daily experience. And when they come onto a campus, what do they see? Do they see a school that tells them they are valued, right? That we value creativity and innovation to the moment that they actually enter the campus, right? The entry experience. Are we empowering staff to do those social and emotional check-ins? Right. So let's say, for example, a student is experiencing trauma or is having a difficult day. Do they have the opportunity to take a shower, to take a nap, to wash their clothes or to even meet with a mental health professional? Right. Providing space for those services to take place. We also know that food is a critical foundation. Right. Are we providing quality meals and a dining experience to match? And are we allowing students to have access to food throughout the day, building off your incredible central kitchen? Right. To allow that to roll out to all sites. We also know that. Movement matters, right? On one hand, we're talking fitness facilities, athletic fields, but also how are we allowing movement to take place in learning environments throughout the day? We know that movement allows us to restore our executive function as well as to concentrate and to focus. But really, I want us to think about our primary learning environments, right? The classrooms where students spend the majority of their day. Are we giving them the furniture, the tools, the resources, the spaces that allow self-directed learning, right? To tap into their curiosities and to their passions uh, for furniture, right? It's not just furniture that moves, but it's the ability to stand, to lounge, to actually sit on the ground in terms of spaces. We know that it's more than just a classroom, right? Are we providing teachers with a suite of spaces to create a community? So they've got the ability to create meaningful connections to students and we're creating a positive culture but also thinking about the unique needs of English language learners, students with disabilities, thinking about acoustic challenges. Are we providing too much stimulation, not enough stimulation, temperature regulation, but also the support that we mentioned earlier for those paraprofessionals to do their work? Are we allowing small group rooms that would allow that um, form of tutoring, that sort of one-on-one -on -one that needs to happen in order to sort of move students out of this COVID era? But it really, the key piece that I want to emphasize with Dr. Stanbuck Stroud said, which is that neighborhoods matter, and ultimately, we have heard from the core planning group that they want students to have access to these types of learning environments in their neighborhood, right? That they want to have access to a neighborhood school. And at the same time, these schools are engines for economic growth in their neighborhoods. Lastly, I just want to talk about the influence on the caregiver, right? How does the learning environment impact teacher well-being, health, so that we can attract and retain the best educators, giving them the greatest environment to work together. Um, also support for families, right? Are we 
providing infrastructure, that social infrastructure, as well as social cohesion throughout an entire community. And I just want to come back to the student for a minute. Are we giving them maximum pathways for careers that don't yet exist, right? This is anywhere from visual arts, performing arts, science, maker spaces, CTE, really pushing that from both the high school level, potentially to the middle school level, and providing those facilities also to elementary students, and bringing that all together the research shows definitively that those things allow students to be more engaged, to be excited to come to school, their health and well-being, their academic achievement, which all links to college and career and civic success. So with that, I'd like to go to the next page, which is just very quickly going to show we are measuring all of these categories across all of your campuses, right? So we're using a data-based way to measure every one of those things that I just described. And then we can use this data so we're not employing a one-size-fits-all, right? We can have context-specific strategies for the unique neighborhood needs and student needs at each one of your campuses, and ultimately to give as many students access to great neighborhood schools as possible. So with that, I'll go to the next slide. And this is to Mark. Yeah, what will all of this information produce? Uh, a data-driven interactive website where the district and its community stakeholders can access transparent information regarding its facility assessments, the educational vision for its facilities, as Anton just shared, and a supporting district-wide master plan. So as you see before you, um, we have an anticipated completion date of late July of this year. And we will come back to you with a for a review and approval, uh, update review and approval in August of 2021 as well. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? And we'll leave it open for board discussion. Thank you. I believe we have five live public comments on this item. Yes, first public comment is Mo Kashmiri. Hi, everybody. Mo Kashmiri here, a parent of a student at William Land. Um, I'm really excited to hear that we're really taking into account making sure that we're climate neutral by 2030. Uh, my, my son actually decided which school to go. We had a choice between going to the local school, which was around the corner, or going to a dual immersion school that was further away. And he chose the local school because, quote, he told me he didn't want to die because of climate change. Um, and that, that really hit me and made me realize that that's a critical part. Uh, I... I'm proud that we're doing this work. I want to ad advocate that the board do another bond measure. If there's $3.5 billion of need, we clearly need to do more bond measures and we need to meet the moment uh, and really give and have schools that kids and families want to go to. We've got to reverse the enrollment drop in this area and, and having nice, shiny, bright facilities that achieve what we need is important. So it encourage us to be do looking at doing another bond. The district can use money to look at polls and things like that. Um, I feel like we need to be proactive on that. And instead of going with a small bond, like $750 million, in my opinion, we should be going bigger. Um, so I, I think right now we have a unique moment with COVID where we can tell people, look, a lot of our classrooms, some of our classrooms didn't even have more than one plug. Some of them don't have windows. Some of them don't, you know, like we don't have the basics that we need for our kids to be successful. So thank you. I look forward to working with you all and hopefully some successful bond measures coming up. Thanks. Terrence Gladney. Good evening. Um, I want to start by saying that there were many, many members of the community who were even unaware that this meeting was taking place. And I understand the urgency of, you know, the previous action item and the timeline associated with it. Um, but in context of this facilities item in previous years, we've had an ad hoc facilities committee of the board. We've had monthly facilities reports. And I feel like those were opportunities to highlight work such as this on a consistent basis. Um, I feel like this work needs the audience and the visibility of a full board meeting. And also the the attendance of a full board, um, you know, membership um, is is too important. Um, it's too great. Um, I I stand beside all of my team members on this committee, um, committed to equity and committed to actually enacting the words that are within our board's vision statement. You know, actually doing something different than what we have done and what has existed for generations and has not worked. Um, 
it's an action. It's, it's an opportunity, though, really. Um, it's, it's the intersection of hope and opportunity um, to capitalize on this moment um, and to activate many meaningful actions that support otherwise ceremonial resolutions of the board. You know, this is one of those opportunities that I speak to you guys frequently about when we pass resolutions of the board. You know, what are the actions behind it that we can actually, I'm sorry, that's, that's a bird, I'm outside. It's a bird flying overhead. I see, I see board member Garcia, like is there a bird in, the, in, the, in, in Cerna? But um, no, this is an opportunity, like this is, this is something that could support those otherwise meaningless resolutions, right? Actions with words. Um, and, and I will say that on the heels of a cabinet restructuring, um, it's my expectation that we now have a streamlined reporting structure that will allow integration of all funding sources, including the $750 million of bond dollars to be integrated, integrated into things such as the LCAP. Um, you know, with, with uh, Rose Ramos, you know, overseeing all of that, it's an opportunity that we should capitalize on and, and it's too great, right? Um, you know, the first thing students see when they walk to our schools is the building, it's the gates, it's the entry, it's, it's the people, that, that greet them and and that's what bond dollars mean and 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 you know no pun intended but this work around bond funds and bond dollars has bonded so many members of our community um, stakeholders community members parents staff members and and experts such as RSS and DLR group and I'm blessed to be working alongside of them and we're all committed to this but our work only means something if you guys as a board stand and act with your ability and authority to been elected to to uh, enact. So thank you guys so much for listening to this. And I hope that you guys bring it back to a full regular board meeting so that it does get highlighted and uplifted in the way that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gladney. Sarah Kingsley and Renee Webster Hawkins will be giving their time to our last public comment from Angie Sutherland. Hello, everyone. Um, I just want to say thank you to the team for presenting this very detailed report um, in alignment with one of the board's resolutions from October 2020, recognizing the rights of students with disability to a quality and inclusive education. We'd like to acknowledge, acknowledge that far too many students are pushed to segregated classroom settings miles away from their own neighborhoods. There's an overrepresentation of students being sent to separate schools, denying their right to be educated in the least restrictive environment. Federal education law or the Individuals with Disabilities Act has two federal uh, important requirements for a child's placement. A child with an IEP should be with kids in general ed to the maximum extent that is appropriate and special classes, separate schools or removal from the general education class should only happen when a child's learning or thinking difference, a disability under IDEA is so severe that supplementary aids and services can't provide the child with an appropriate education. With the October 2020 resolution, the board recognized that students with disabilities are general education students first, and that every educational, operational, and budget decision we make begins with the belief that students with disabilities have a right to and have the ability to learn alongside their non-disabled peers and equitable and meaningful opportunities to learn and grow. However, despite the affirmative rights and appreciation for students with disabilities in our federal and state laws, students with disabilities as a whole suffer poor academic and social emotional outcomes in our district, especially those who are students of color and English language learners. To be their best, students must feel a sense of connectedness and belonging to their school community. This means equitable and accessible design, which this presentation highlighted. Busing students to faraway sites and having to transfer to different sites multiple times based on IEP placement does not provide connectedness or belonging for students or families. Families often lack awareness of programs at sites and accept what is offered through their IEP. We would like to impress upon the board the need that every site plan, including retrofitting or adding classroom space to ensure that all students with disabilities can be served appropriately at their neighborhood school in inclusive practices, educational environments. In addition, portable classrooms need to be evaluated if not already part of this plan. Many of the special day classes exist in portables at the back of campus, separating students from the other students and resulting in othering. If the district is committed to provide a quality and inclusive education, this must change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Sutherland. 
All right, I will open this up for discussion. I have a, um, a few comments and questions. Um, I first want to just thank everyone that um, has worked on this throughout the years. I know this is long anticipated um, uh, for all of us involved. Um, and so just, I, this is so much to absorb and I know this, a lot of work went into this. So I just want to thank each of you. Um, I wanted to know if it was possible um, for us to get like just a, um, a list of sites by facilities condition, it's kind of like a, just a general sheet, just saying, by the by the way that you guys ranked them like fair poor um good i can't remember what the other ones were yes um this is rose ramos president pritchett and i could um ask mark to share with you when that website will go live what's going to happen is that there's going to be a website with all this data loaded and you're going to be able to drill down to one school and down to what, whether they need HVAC or very specific items, and then you'll be able to, to zoom out to high level. But Mark, do you want to share when that website will be available to the public? Yeah, the data will be available, as I indicated, uh, around June 1st. The website itself would be available after board approval um, in, in, uh, um, in August, after, after priorities have been set and uh, we get to give you another update, the members another update. Um, but the data will become available, and for uh, for um, uh, Member Pritchett, uh, we can we can definitely sort that out and, and provide that to staff for you. That's fantastic. That led me like that just pretty much answered my next question because I wanted to know if there was going to be a website dashboard that we'd be able to drill down by site and mm -hmm. the area of the schools and all that. So that answers Absolutely. that question. Um, I kind of figured that would be, but I didn't want to assume. <laughs> um, and then. Um, with it being a five-year master plan, we started this in 2019. So I know some of the sites were looked at back as far as 2019 and then kind of COVID hit, then kind of slowed things down, I'm sure. Um, but I'm just wondering this five-year master plan, will it start at like from this year, five years forward, or is it from 2019 and then five years? Yeah, this is Lee Sada. Um, that's a great question. Um, Member Pritchett, and I think the answer to that is that while the assessments were done in 2019, we've continued to have funds from our previous bond, bonds, and we have been continuing to do some of the necessary repair work to various sites. So I think it's uh, fair to say that, you know, really this, we'll sort of think of this overall plan as something that goes forward from approximate, the, the approximate time that it is approved by the board. Um, you can see just in the variance of the overall numbers in terms of uh, the current bond versus the overall need that this is um, going to get us off to a really good start, but there will be continued needs over time. So, of course, our goal is to do a you know, great job for the district, be very transparent and open about our processes, make sure that we have the proper community input uh, so that this lays the foundation and the groundwork for additional bonds, as was mentioned by one of our public speakers. And then we're able to keep it updated from there on out of things that come up in, in nature of from our school sites. Is that correct, Lee? Yes, uh, we have a regular database that our facilities team, uh, you know, receives um, requests from the sites. And of course, our team is out on the sites doing their own assessments on a regular basis. Uh, you know, one of the silver linings from the COVID process, as you all know, is that we were able to assess our mechanical systems in fairly great detail and do quite a bit of work to get them tuned up, which is continuing on and ongoing. Uh, so we have, you know, kind of down to the minute type of information that we do continue to receive from our sites. Uh, it is not uncommon in the world of bond planning to do what we call a five-year plan, uh, which kind of helps us do priorities for the five-year period. But, you know, these plans are fluid and do need to change over time. And of course, our job is to keep the board informed so that we can make modifications during that time. And then let's say in approximately five years, we may want or the board may ask us to do another round or an update. And that is not uncommon in the world of on planning uh, in various districts. I'm sure DLR, because they do work with a lot of districts, can probably also attest to that. Perfect. Okay. And then um, my last question is for um, Ms. Ramos. Um, can you just kind of get into a little bit about like after the board approves this in August, um, what's next after that? Yeah, yes, I can. Uh, Member Pr uh, President Pritchett. Yep. Yeah, from there, we start to, because of course, what's going to come with that is the prior 
prioritization of projects. So we'll start planning for that um, to go ahead and start folding in the projects that will, um, you know, uh, be taken on over the next few years and uh, and sharing regular updates, um, certainly with the board and with the community that, you know, now we have this plan and, you know, we're going to follow it for the most part, unless there's modifications made like Lee spoke to. And that's pretty common. Um, if we find that we're going to pursue a new ed specification that requires a modification to our facilities for whatever reason in the area, I'm just going to say technology for, we may need to make a modification to our plan. And of course, that will be shared. So basically, it's kind of our roadmap for now spending our bond dollars. And as you heard, um, based on, on the assessments that were done in 2019, we know we have a far more need than we have in our current uh, measure. So um, we'll be sharing those updates. And, and not to say that, you know, the, the, um, this latest measure is going to be all applied to, to the assessments. There'll be a balance between those assessments based on immediate needs, right? You want to do take care of those things that create, you know, the most harm to your facilities and deteriorate them far faster because you're not addressing them. So you'll have a balance of those along with some of the ed specifications or what's also referred to as the visioning stuff to support our educational programs. And that'll all be decided, you know, by you, of course, our board, as we share that data with you. But yes, it's, it'll be our blueprint for moving forward. Okay, that's helpful. And then um, we have um, a bond oversight committee for measures Q and R. Does our same bond oversight committee then get rolled over for measure H? Not necessarily. Um, our, uh, the request from the board was to go ahead and recruit for our new measure H. And of course, that does not stop our current members from applying and serving on our uh, new uh, bond oversight. And because we have not tapped into those resources yet, we have not uh, formed that bond yet. We're still working, you know, as, as you knew, the last couple last board meetings, we just um, approved selling of the final bonds for uh, Measure Q. So we're not quite done with those yet. And, and, you know, we got delayed. We were supposed to be here about a year ago, but with COVID, everything's kind of been delayed by about a year. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, questions, member Garcia? Um, yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I felt like there was a lot of information, and um, but I also have a lot of questions. So I'm going to try and limit mine. Um, and um, I think you know, as I'm digesting this information and processing uh, the equity lens in terms of how it applies to a facilities bond and facilities um, themselves, I'm trying to reconcile sort of equity as it applies um, to students and, and serving the students with the greatest needs and then trying to figure out um, what does that look like with facilities because of um, we have a lot of schools that are very old, um, and so so I'm just trying to figure out how to how to reconcile equity when when I'm thinking of of really old facilities that don't necessarily um, align with um, sort of how we we define equity in terms of serving the the students with the greatest need. So I'm wondering if you can maybe dig down a little bit into the analysis that you did um, and, and help me understand that a little bit more. Why don't I kick that off and then I'll ask members of the consult, both consulting teams if they'd like to contribute. Um, as Rose said earlier, we're looking at a balance of projects uh, where we have certain needs that we have to address due to health and safety concerns and or uh, accessibility issues that we are going to be prioritizing because we need to. But then the next level um, of uh, information we'll be looking at will come from uh, two, two different factors. One is the sort of student success factors, which are based on the six pedals that Anton um, kind of talked about. And the second bucket, if you will, is based on this in equity index that the team is developing. And I think the answer to your question, which is a very good one, is we don't quite have the balance yet of how much of each of those two other factors will weigh into how we distribute the funding. But those are kind of the three legs of the chair, so to speak, that we are looking at using. And what we're currently talking about with the core planning group is how much influence will each of those three legs of the chair have on the decisions of how to prioritize the first set of projects. 
So I think your question is a very good one and quite appropriate at this point in time. And I think the answer is um, we're still working on it. And I'm not trying to avoid the question. I'm just trying to share with you, you know, kind of where we are in the process. No, that, that's very helpful, um, knowing that it's still sort of um, fluid. Um, and I, I guess my other question um, is trying to figure out what our baseline is in terms of what we'd like to see at every single school site, right? Um, and then and then where that gap is between what 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 we want to see and what we have and how to fill that gap. So um, is this where the pedals come in? Um, is, are the pedals our baseline? Is that is that is that what it is? I would say that if in an ideal world, if all of that three and a half billion dollars were available today, each of the schools would have those pedals filled out. But obviously with the $750 million that we have to spend, we won't be able to achieve all of the pedals in their full configuration. So the question then is, to your point, you know, how do we come up with that priority list of which schools will receive that first tranche of funding uh, versus um, you know, necessary repair work that we need to do? So again, we don't quite yet have the answers, but those are the things that we're talking about. But it is okay. uh, it's fairly easy to envision that certain schools will receive certain amount of fundings to actually fill in some of the pedals, particularly in schools where student success is, is an issue due to lack of uh, space resources. Right. So I'm, I'm envisioning equalizing the, the level like playing field was mentioned earlier. And but I, I'm still trying to understand what the baseline is and what our reality is so that we can we can fill that. Um, and then my next question is about um, we know that um, transitional kindergarten is is going to be something that is going to become a reality in California in the next few years. So I'm wondering um if, if additional analysis needs to be made relative to the need for um, for transitional kindergarten facilities to for four year olds, so um, I don't know if if that is part of this whole analysis um, that will come before us in August for approval. Yeah, that's new information to all of us. As you know, the governor just you know signed that into law recently, or you know, wrote his Not yet. Yeah. So um, I think that will require another um, kind of round of data information. Uh, the good news is that because of the assessments that were done, as Anton mentioned, we have a pretty good sense of which class, which school sites have additional capacity. Um, but that doesn't mean that the capacity is necessarily even across the board or where we necessarily need it. So we, we need to have that next level of um, information uh, to make those assessments. But we do have a good sense of where we have open classrooms, for example. So those would be places that could be fairly easy from a facilities perspective to open programs, just because you know we have underutilized classrooms. Uh, right, and I just wanna make sure that those are aligned where the need is, right? Um, so maybe we don't have capacity at some schools, but the need is there. So trying to trying to figure that out. So I appreciate that. And um, so in terms of just two more, two more questions. So in terms of the funds, um, I think it would be helpful not only to think about how much of the work can be done with bond dollars, but also outside of bond, um, the bond dollars. Um, there is um, proposed um, set aside funds at the state level for for um, facility a facilities grant for transitional kindergarten to prepare for that, and um, also, um, you know, we we heard about this um, earlier in this year, uh, related I think to um, you know HVACs and whatnot um, to apply for um, additional funds. I, I think at the time we we still don't know what the um, eligibility criteria is or what the application process is. I can't remember exactly the bill number. I think it was AB eight forty one, seven forty one, or something like that. But but just really thinking about. Um, dollars that we can use outside of, of um, Measure H and, um, and folding that into the overall pot of money for facilities, right? I mean, we can use some of our federal dollars as well. 
So, um, so just, just really wanting to make sure that, that we look, um, um, beyond, um, AB seven, uh, or measure age dollars. And then lastly, um, in terms of sort of updates, um, I, I think this is, this is really exciting that our, our neighborhoods, our schools, our kids, um, our parents, our community is going to see some real change at school sites. You know, it's, you know, something new coming at the neighborhood school. Right. And, um, so I, I really want to make sure that we have, um, uh, a, a robust sort of, um, uh, I don't know, um, uh, in, you know, meetings, community meetings, or, or in terms of, of how we're going to approach sharing this with the community, how the board stays informed um, on a regular basis. Again, um, you have a lot of information. I'm sure when you, we see the final product, I, you know, we're going to have a lot of questions. So I, I really want to make sure that that is um, something that happens on a continuous basis. And then I did see that the meetings with the core group um, end in, in June, but I know you're trying to finalize your work in July so that the board adopts it in August. Wondering how we can, um, how we can keep that sort of conversation going, um, you know, beyond the, the work that's being done by DLR. So, so just trying to figure that out um, because this is, this is an exciting um, time in investing in our facilities, um, but also um, also want to make sure that our community um, is part of the process and the journey. So, so thank you. Thank you, Member Garcia. Member Morosky. Thank you, and uh, similarly, I'm uh, you know trying to process a lot of information here. Um, I appreciate the the update. Um, I have been uh, looking forward to to this update for some time, and understand that you know COVID uh, threw a wrench in some of our our ability to do that that planning. Um, so I have a couple of questions about you know just this is the the first time we've done a facilities master plan during my tenure here, um, and I understand you know kind of the the broad board's role as um, you know, setting direction for the district um, and the role of, of staff and the uh, administrators as being decision support to like bring to us kind of key strategic decision points of kind of where we go, how we prioritize things. Um, so I'm just curious, uh, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not even sure who, who this question is too, but um, you know what? How does the how does the board's role or feedback fit into this process? I'm trying to figure out. You know, if if the I know the the facilities master plan should uh, support the instructional academic vision of the district. So if the board wanted to push forward, you know, I'm just to throw out you know CTE as a major um, initiative. Uh, or priority, or outdoor classrooms, or space for mental health, wellness, or you know, like any any of these kinds of threads of, of priorities. Like, where does that come into the process? Or is or yeah, I, I'm just kind of um, I don't understand the the board's role in kind of defining what you know what the direction is and what the decision points are well i'll, I'll venture to start or rose do you want to go first it doesn't go ahead me I'll, I'll i can follow yeah okay so what i was just going to simply say was that it's a great it's an excellent question and i, I do think that um, we're starting from a place of using the lcap as a, um, kind of our, our north star as we said earlier by the rssc team and i, I do believe that the board kind of as a whole has had input into kind of that overall process. But I do think that as we start to get our, our priorities together in terms of the three buckets that I spoke about, the student success, the equity, and the facilities condition, we'll be coming to you with a list of projects that you will be approving. And I think that's just sort of an ongoing process. And so I would invite you to consider this as really just the beginning of a process that you'll be continuing to engage in over time. And if we need to pull 
aside a, a, another meeting or spend a little time talking about whether we're going to be emphasizing CPE versus um, food services versus a welcome center, which are three of those about six pedals. I think it's, you know, I think that would be something that we could do. Um, but I do think that some of those things are also expressed in the LCAP. And so as we become, as our team becomes more familiar with it and that data becomes sort of entered into the equation, um, there has been some strategic guidance provided in that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I, I guess I would appreciate maybe um, coming back around to that as, um, and, you know, having more, more of those regular updates and, and feedback. Um, and I can add a little bit more, Member Morawski, if, if it's helpful. Um, for I can share that in former districts that I've been in, when we bring to you like these this three prong approach or the three legs, is that there's um, tiers within each one, and within each tier, it's defined like let's take the student success one. You may say that we're going to need to upgrade all of our science labs because we know our LCAP. You know, I'm just making this up. Supports that we know we have a need there. And there may be another tier in there to support um, um, agriculture or some other initiative. And so the board may decide, of course, given the resources that, you know, we really are going to focus that on this, this segment of our, um, of, of our uh, grade spans. And or we're just going to emphasize more on science this time or just a combination of such. And so we'll bring you those levels with the information and the dollars attributed to each of those. And with the data to support it, like why, why are those there? Why are those rising to the top versus all the others? And that's where the board, you know, you, still, you have that discussion. And of course, staff providing you with more information behind that. So you can, you know, kind of make some choices also within those, um, those different tiers within those three legs. Um, yeah, so that's the way I've seen it done as well. There, there's a variety of ways we can show you and we'll make it not too complicated so that, you know, the data will support the, those decisions. Okay. Yeah. I would appreciate that. I would appreciate, um, you know, maybe, maybe there's an example out there as you, as you say of, you know, how, how that could be done or how that could be brought back. Um, I just really want to, want to understand, um, you know, I, I don't think it's our job to be observers of, uh, of, of a process like this. This is really important. You know, um, I know my community and, the, you know, the Sacramento community at large and in, invested in believing in, you know, our district to, uh, to make these improvements. So I feel like, you know, and, and I totally um, respect that the board should be operating here. And I'm not, you know, suggesting that we get into, you know, finding particular projects that we want to advocate for or something. I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think that's our role. I think, do think our role is to set that, set that direction and make sure it's kind of the whole plan and prioritization is supporting the district. And that we also have, you know, um, conversations at the board level um, because we have limited resources on how to prioritize. So I, um, I appreciate that. And maybe we can follow up on, if there are, you know, other examples that you could identify of like kind of what that looks like that might help me help us all understand um, what our role will be like um, going forward over the next uh, next year or two. So um, really appreciate it. I, I, you know, look forward to seeing that uh, the data. I, can, uh, I just wanted to go back to the, the time frame of that. Um, I understood from the comments that the data would be available after we adopt the plan. Is that is that right? Or the um, the website? Mark, was that? Yeah, I can I can answer that. Thank you, Rose. Um, <clears throat> no, no, uh, Member Morosky, the uh, uh, the data will be available. The data we've gathered will be available to staff the, around the first next week, early next week. The how it how it communicates to your community through a interactive website we will bring back to you first for your review and approval prior to that being released is what is what the intention is but the data will become available very shortly in fact the staff already possesses all of the facilities condition assessments and uh, all of the uh, the um, energy audits that we performed on every one of the campuses amongst other other things like technology, safety, and security, all of those are in the assessment packages that are available. And we can link those into a kind of a draft website, if you will, so that it is accessible to uh, the board and community. 
Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. I'm, I'm really, um, really curious and looking forward to uh, reviewing that, obviously. Um, can I just ask, uh, in terms of what the what the master plan will entail, um, are there recommendations as to, you know, how to strategically approach, or is that something that, you know, the master plan just gives us the data and the conditions and we go forward and do that work? I'm going to go ahead and just share Mark on the assessment piece. You can jump in here, but for the assessment member Morelsky, the, the, the health and safety component, that's going to be broken up into like immediate needs. What needs to be done one year because otherwise, you know, we are going to, our roof's going to cave in and, and, you know, it's going to destroy all of the, the items within. And then you'll have a two year, three years. So we can start to, um, to, to, to chip away at these projects and plan for future bonds. Because as you know, I mean, we've already said it like 10 times. I think we don't have enough to cover the three and a half billion dollars. So that's going to allow us to ease into this and then not use that entire 750 million on those immediate needs and use some of that for the educational items as well. And so that's when we come to you, like Lee described with the, you know, the three buckets um, that we're going to be addressing with the tiers. And so the tiers for the assessment will be the years by which when we absolutely have to address these items, because otherwise we'll get to a point where the, you know, they, the classrooms will not be usable or they'll be very unsafe for students or they won't meet ADA compliance. And mm -hmm. so in terms of severity, what needs for that component? And then the others, it's just going to depend on the educational um, goals and, and the data to support those. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Well, Mark, did I, oh, go ahead. Sorry about that. That oh, that's that's great. Thank you so much, Ms. Ramos. Okay. Well, I just I just lastly say, um, you know, uh, in in trying to think through the the equity aspects of you know how how things would be um, prioritized, I I think it might be worth that might be worth another conversation um, to make sure that the board in the community fully understands you know what that means and and how that. Um, you know, how that will be set up to drive our decision making. Um, because I think this is, you know, the, this is, it's always a tricky conversation. And I think that, you know, we need to ensure that the board and the community is bought into whatever the, you know, the final draft, um, maybe that's the, maybe that's what, what you bring back to the board or something is that, you know, a, the, the draft, because um, there's many ways you can set it up, right? Like how much you weigh one thing versus the other. So um, yeah, so that's my final comment. I do think that's worth a, worth an additional conversation and just um, appreciate so much uh, everyone's work on this. Member Rhodes, did you have your thing up earlier? Uh, sure. All right, I'm calling on you. <laughs> um. Uh, first off, once again, uh, thank you to my colleagues for um, their analysis and questions. Uh, I think they're pinpointed and, and uh, important to hear. Um, I, I guess how I start off with say, Anton, um, you're a preacher, my brother. You're preaching up there, and I and I, and I appreciate it. Um, we we talk about uh, schools and neighborhood schools. I think, um, like I always say, strong schools build strong neighborhoods and communities and, and vice versa, right? And um, the conditions of our school sites are an equity issue. Um, they hold historical and racial uh, context and inequities that are kind of built into our system. And so us tackling these things um, does align with our equity statement. Um, and, it's, and it's very important. Um, also, I would like to say um, I enjoy seeing these uh, data points on paper, and I'm glad on June 1st uh, that we're going to be receiving something uh, or the week of the first we'll be receiving something to the board, um, probably in a BCC, a board, a board, a BC, a board communication um, to us breaking down areas of our schools and then and, and which where they lined at, right? We saw on the piece of paper, it said poor, fair, 
good condition um, with little dots, um, but we don't see the school sites. And I know that all of us want to see the school sites. Um, but me personally, uh, I don't just want to see the dots or the numbers on paper. Uh, I would request um, that uh, Superintendent uh, yourself, uh, Nathaniel, uh, and I uh, go out and actually see some of the sites, especially in Area 5. Um, specifically for me speaking, I would make that request um, that we physically go and see it. Um, I think during my tenure here, what is six months now? Is, has it been six months? There you go, six months. Um, I haven't done a facilities walkthrough necessarily in my area. Um, and I think that uh, that's necessary. And, and, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about uh, all of our presentations today, um, trying to make sure to uh, not get too excited and, um, and temper this excitement that I hold currently, uh, but not just for me, but for uh, my community, for uh, the district um, and what we are looking at um, really doing. So uh, with that on the table, I would like to reiterate my requests uh, after we get the information on June the 1st or the week of the 1st, uh, that myself, Nathaniel, and Superintendent Aguilar, that we go and look at some of our sites and have a facility walkthrough, um, and especially in Area 5. I also uh, would say all of the board members that are here uh, to also do that in your area. That's all. That's to the member, Shake, did you have your, your, your sign up? I did not, but I'll just quickly say that um, you asked all of my questions, um, President Pritchett, and I would just underline uh, Member Rhodes' request for a board communication as soon as possible with the information, because um, I'm very curious and I think it'll be really important in the coming however much time to understand how the breakdown goes. Great. Thank you. Member Garcia. Yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, just chime in on board member Rhodes uh, comment and request about visiting school facilities. I think that if there's an opportunity to um, partner up with um, other board members um, from deferring areas, that we do that so that we can learn um, together about each other's needs, especially when some of our communities look so different. I welcome that opportunity. You must have been reading my mind. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I think I that's a great idea. I concur. Yeah. Fantastic. Simon. Simon. All right. Uh, President this, Bridget, what we'll yeah. do just in terms of uh, uh, an immediate response is we will um, organize uh, sort of an in-person two-by uh, in the form of visits to school sites um, just so that we can abide by Brown Act um, requirements and treat the two buys as um as uh as a visit to to those school sites i just want to very quickly just comment um and, and thank the team for um uh hearing uh from our board and our community uh, the importance of getting these equity index uh, indicators right uh, as you know, we've been very committed. Um, the EIIS tool, for example, comes out of uh, our approach to using uh, data uh, to think about how to actualize equity. Uh, we are going to be having a workshop uh, here very soon with the board on how we will use some of those indices uh, as we think about the use of one-time funds per the board policy that you passed recently. Uh, and um, in the case of facilities, um, you know, the fact that, that our team was willing to lean in and, um, and accept that uh, this is not uh, something that is commonly used or commonly done, uh, I just want to uh, commend our team for uh, doing this uh, very intentionally. Um, and I do think it's important that we keep the board apprised of what elements and the weights uh, that will be associated to uh, the data that we use uh, to uh, run uh, reports uh, so that hopefully uh, our community and our board is proud of how we uh, manage those limited resources um, so that we can think about what all of our students deserve. Um, and, and I, I, uh, at, um, I, I don't wanna appear biased. I, of course, have visited a lot of schools and, and some of them, unfortunately, 
uh, feel like they're taking us back to the 1960s uh, in terms of color schemes and uh, the, the the facilities themselves and um, uh, the conditions of pools. Um, I mean, these are these are very very serious inequities in our system still um, that I think we need to we need to address right away. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, with that, this is an informational item, which will be. Oh, I apologize. I just really quickly, I wanted to. Rec- yeah, I just wanted to request from the superintendent that I also be included in the um in the planning for those visits. Absolutely, yeah. And I am curious, Superintendent, like, the, do the planning of these visits need to take place um, during this after school, like after um, during the summer months when school is not in session? Because right now we have kids in small cohorts for, or we have them in. We have actually collapse cohorts. <laughs> well, anyhow, we have smaller groups at school sites. Um, and with COVID, I'm assuming we don't want a lot of visitors to school sites. And I don't know how that works through if we're still able to do it while school sessions, or maybe we do it after kids go home during the day. Yeah. Why don't we just uh, commit to doing it as quickly as possible? Um, okay. And um, um, I, I do think that, uh, you know, our return to health plan does. Um, limit visitors to essential visitors. And so I think if we can be flexible, it's best for us to do it um, after our sessions are over. Okay, perfect. All right, no more questions. All right. (laughs) With that, this is an informational item which will be brought back to us. Um, We're looking forward to seeing the final product. Thank you again to everyone involved. We appreciate your work. Uh, With that, I will entertain a motion. Moved. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Oh, we're going to adjourn back into closed session. All right.
All right. We are back from closed session. Do we have any announcements uh, from closed session? No announcements. All right. With that, I will entertain a motion. Moved. <laughs> Can I get a second? All right. Student preferential vote. Aye. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Good night. <laughs>